an unjust trial. Bakir Van, from the Baskerville family, dedicated his whole life to his family. But in the end, he ended up being accused of treason, accused of conspiring with demons, which led him straight to the guillotine. While awaiting his death, he swore that if he could live again, he would never again be a mere hunting dog receiving orders. And then he suddenly wakes up, hearing children crying. Was this hell? Amidst the children's cries, a man passed by analyzing them. This is the patriarch of the Baskerville family. Observing that all the children were just crying and crying, he feels frustrated and heads towards the door to leave. But to his surprise, not everyone was crying. There was one, among so many, who was just restless in his crib. Seeing this, he advises to take the children to a place called the Cradle of Swords. And with that, Vikir finally understood. He had returned to when he was just a child, before becoming just a hunting dog. He, being born as an illegitimate child, ended up not receiving a proper upbringing. People like him just needed to learn to be faithful to their obligations. Murder, espionage, ambush. He had to deal with all kinds of bad acts, obeying all the orders of the Baskerville family. Their goal was to be the best among the seven great families. The reason for his loyalty loyalty was simple. He just wanted to receive recognition from Hugo and his family. The gates of the demonic world were opened ten years ago, and a long fight against the demons ended in a victory for humanity, and the reward for the one who dedicated himself most to the cause, who was most faithful to all of them, was execution. The reason for this was that he knew too much. Thinking about it, he just wishes not to live like this anymore. However, what he really wanted to do was to seek revenge. But now he is just a newborn, and he knows that what he needs now is to get stronger. Cradle of Swords is his great chance for that. This is a place where the children of the Baskerville need to pass. They are left in a labyrinth of swords and their courage is tested as they go towards the river Styx. This, in turn, is a legendary river that makes a child's body as resilient as steel. However, the number of children who can take advantage of this benefit is limited. In his previous attempt in life, the protagonist failed to come first because he was overtaken by his brothers. But this time, it will be different. He quickly reached the river and immediately jumped in. The longer he stays at the bottom, the stronger he will become. Some family members, realizing that he is still immersed in the depths of the river, become desperate, thinking that if he stays there, he will end up dying. But unlike them, the family leader is only impressed. And when he asks the family butler how long it has been since he submerged in the river, he is informed that it has been seven minutes already. Hugo, still without moving a muscle, only says that he should get out of there. The protagonist hears it, but it's not easy for him to just come back. And realizing that he was at his limit, he also starts to drink the water. But it's over, his limit has come. And as he sinks into the depths of the river, Hugo pulls him out of the water. He was proud because an ambitious person had emerged in his family. And he had been submerged for so long that even his teeth had grown. Seeing that Hugo was proud of him, in his mind, there was only thirst for revenge. And he swears there, that he will wipe out the Baskerville family with his own hands. In his previous life, at just eight years old, he was a genius to the world, but he was nothing more than a mediocre member to his family. At 20, he was the main in assassination, reconnaissance, and subjugation missions. When he turned 29, he was restricted by the talents of the direct family and realized his limitations in fencing. And when he turned 30, the gate connected to the demonic world opened, which started the Great War, which lasted for almost 10 years. But in the end, it ended with the victory of the humans, who fought bravely throughout this time and who was now 40 years old, was rewarded for his loyalty as a good hunting dog. His reward was false accusations, slander, and a death sentence. Waking up in the cradle, he then comes to the conclusion that he managed to pass through the river Styx. With this, he managed, at least initially, to become stronger than in his previous life. While reflecting, he notices that there is an unknown woman approaching the cradle. The woman quickly puts a box in the cradle, and what seemed to be a gift was actually an attempted murder. Two rare snakes emerge from the box. The protagonist only wonders if all of this was really necessary to assassinate him. He does not overlook the fact that one of the maids called the woman who left that box, Madam. This is because few women in the Baskerville family would be called that. Without wasting any more time, the snakes advance to attack him, but he easily holds them back and kills them right there. The next day, the people of the Baskerville house witness the terrifying scene of a baby peacefully sleeping soaked in the blood of venomous snakes. All the nannies who worked that day were tortured and executed, 
Yet the reason why the dead snakes were in the cradle was not discovered. Only he knows the whole truth behind this. Thus, eight years passed. The professor then explains that there are four phases for those who follow the path of the sword. These are sword initiate, sword specialist, sword graduates, and the last one, which is the state in which the aura imbued in the sword by the bearer becomes solidified, thus making it possible to change the shape according to the will. Those who achieve this feat are called sword masters. And to finish, he informs that the patriarch of the Baskerville house, Hugo, is a sword master. Noticing that Vakir is immersed in his thoughts, the professor thinks he is reflecting and absorbing his teachings. What he is thinking now, knowing that Hugo is a sword master, is how many years it will take for him to be able to kill him. However, the other children, his brothers, don't like all the attention he's been getting. Taking him to an isolated place, they ask about all the strange rumors surrounding him. Like the one that he spent seven minutes in the river Styx, and the one that he killed two snakes while he was in the cradle. It is then revealed to us that these three were responsible in his previous life for attacking him when he was fleeing after the false accusations, known as Hugo's trident. Wanting to prove the first rumor, the seven minutes in the river sticks, one of them comes up behind Vakir and holds his breath. He could easily get out of this situation, but decides to play along with their little game. So one minute passed, then three minutes, ten minutes. Vakir continued to endure calmly, noticing that maybe they had already passed the limit. The brother holding him let go, but before pulling his hand away, he has one of his fingers torn off. His brothers say that they will go to the priest to have the finger put back on later. Hearing this, the protagonist asks who allowed them to leave. Furious, one of the brothers advances and tries to stab him, and thus another rumor is proven true, as the knife does nothing against his skin. Now it's his turn to play against his brothers. The brothers exclaim that they are the oldest, and that Vakir should respect them. However, this is the Baskerville family, where age does not matter as long as you have strength and talent. One of the brothers, frightened, soon realizes the rumors were true. But before he could do anything, Vikir punches him in the face. The other twin tries to react, but soon falls to the ground as well. One of them informs that they shouldn't be afraid, as they will be treated soon. But who said the protagonist will let them leave this room easily? Bending down, he picks up the knife that one of them was carrying. And then Vikir speaks, saying that since he's feeling generous, he'll let one of them go. But who leaves depends on their choice. Tossing the knife he had in hand to them, he says he won't wait long, as at least one of the three must live. And with that, Vakir caused what he wanted, the collapse of what would have been the Baskerville Trident. Changing the scene, the Baskerville clan's butler Johan Barrymore informs the Patriarch that there has been another conflict with the Morgue clan at the Ruby Mine, and that the Morgue clan is claiming ownership of those territories. In response to this, the Patriarch simply says he will have the opportunity to discuss this with them soon, since the Morgue clan will be coming to them shortly. Concluding this matter, he asks Yihan the butler if he has anything else to say. Then Yihan talks about the midterm evaluation at school, informing thus that Vakir placed first in the written test. He is also informed that in five days will be the practical exams, and that the castle's guardian knights have already departed and taken a trip to prepare the students. Hugo then exclaims that if that's the case, the castle must be completely empty. However, the butler has one more thing to say. There was a big fight between the young masters. Here he is referring to the fight between the triplets and the Kier. Astonished, Hugo asks how many died. The butler says none died, but the oldest triplet's teeth were almost all broken, the middle twin's jaw was crushed, and the youngest had his left index finger torn off. He even says they are already being treated. However, the damage was not only physical but also mental. Hugo even thinks it might have been an internal fight, but soon dismisses that option. They were too close to have been an internal fight. The butler agrees and informs that it was actually a fight with one of the other brothers, saying that the person who left them in that state was the brother one year younger than the three, young master Vakir. Hugo then sends for Vakir, and he quickly arrives. Hugo questions him about hurting the triplets, and without any remorse, he says they are receiving treatment for it. However, Hugo was referring not to the physical damage, but to how he wounded their hearts. Since that day, they began eating separately and stopped talking to each other. To finish, Hugo asks if he thinks he did anything wrong. However, Vikir did nothing wrong, because he is stronger than them. Hearing this, he asks again, 
if he feels no guilt at all. And he says the triplets came before him there and kindly forgave him. But Vakir knows. He knows he shouldn't apologize for his actions. And using the same words that Hugo once used in his past life, he responds by saying that he believes forgiveness is nothing more than the excuse of the weak who can seek revenge. Hugo is impressed, as he believes strength is justice, which means being weak is a sin. Thanks to this, he calls the butler and orders him to go to the food warehouse and give Vakir whatever he desires. Hugo wishes the boy luck in the practical exam and tells him not to lose to anyone from the main family. Annoyed, he agrees and thus withdraws. Now, in the warehouse, he said he wanted chocolates, however, he didn't want processed chocolate, but cocoa beans, the unprocessed seeds. The butler even thinks he wanted the seeds because they equate to 100 liters of chocolate each. But the protagonist didn't want the chocolates to eat them. The real purpose of these seeds would soon be revealed in the practical exam that will take place in five days. When that day comes, an unprecedented incident will assail the Baskervilles. Worldwide, the Baskerville family was known as the Berserker Clan. This was due to the fact that even the children, who had already undergone a rigorous education program, had to do things like climb mountains as endurance training right after they learned to walk rest was only permitted during designated hours. At bedtime, they slept alongside the corpse of a demon creature, or even a live baby creature. The goal was to make them capable of adapting to the hostile environment. This allowed the young hunting dogs to face extremely difficult evaluations. That's why they are called the Berserker Clan. And at the present moment, an evaluation of this level was forthcoming on a mountain infested with demon creatures. The instructor explains that their objective is simple, survive there for one month and hunt the demon creatures. They just need to keep these two things in mind. In the evaluation, they will be rewarded with points. These points will be divided into saving someone's life, 10 points, saving someone's life without suffering serious injuries, 30 points, surviving by eliminating another participant, 50 points, surviving and hunting demon creatures, 70 points, and fulfilling all the conditions stated beforehand, 90 points. In addition, each of them received one brooch a brooch that, if stolen from others, will result in extra points. Wishing them good luck, the instructor gives them advice. Do not leave the restricted area. The guardian knights will secretly score them during the test, which means they will be constantly monitored. Afraid, some students talk among themselves about the rumors of Vakir. They are all curious to know if he will also perform as well in the practical evaluation as he did in the written one. And with the sound of the bell, the evaluation begins. Some rush to secure an advantageous position first, and others join teams to steal points from those who are alone. The triplets, even still feuding, remain together. The instructor, after all the students leave, reflects on the evaluation. It doesn't encourage killing others, however, it's not prohibited, and because there's no point reduction for specific deaths, everyone tried to kill each other, and the guardian knights, who will be watching everything, will only ensure that deaths remain at a minimum. Watching Vakir, one of these guardians lurks. It's then he realizes Vakir is heading towards an unexplored area, and like the other students, he also wants to see what the protagonist is capable of. Arriving at the spot he wanted, Vakir simply says he can finally enjoy his vacation. The knight is shocked. While everyone else is fighting, he's really just resting. Thinking he just wants to stay hidden there, now disappointed, leaves the area. But this was all just an act by Vakir, because he knew he was being watched. And using the cocoa seeds to remove the smell of the meat that was roasting, his preparations were ready. It's time for his hunt to begin. Days later he leaves his camp, now entering the unexplored area. However, this is not new to him, because in his past life he has been in places like this many times. And more than anyone, he knows that this is the habitat of a creature the hellhound. In his past life, he only managed to face one of these at 18, so clearly it would be too much for his current self at 8 years old. However, he knows a method that even a child would be able to defeat a hellhound, which is by using its weaknesses. Weakness number one, the hellhound can only move in a straight line, as it has difficulty keeping up with curvilinear movements. Weakness number two, water. Demon creatures for some reason cannot pass through water, even if it's in small amounts. In this situation the hellhound will slow down and will approach and expose its fatal weakness, which is opening its mouth while running, thus Vakir uses his chocolate seeds. One grain of this is capable of generating 100 liters of chocolates, and chocolate is a poison for monsters of the dog type. Mocking, he says that a hellhound can't even defeat a mere chocolate, and then he finishes it. By killing demon creatures, his body receives 
experience, or karma, which makes his body stronger. And swinging his sword, now it feels even lighter. If he keeps this up, he will surely be able to regain his strength even before becoming an adult. With this achievement, he only wants to know how Hugo will react after finding out that he managed to defeat a demon creature, which was level B plus in danger. While lost in his thoughts, more enemies emerge, more hellhounds. Decapitating the one he had already defeated, he prepares to fight. But suddenly the dogs become reluctant, as if they were afraid. Which is strange, because these creatures would rather die than submit to prey. An even more challenging enemy had arrived, a Cerberus a creature of level A plus in danger. But Vakir notices something strange. The creature is injured, with arrows all over its body. Upon further thought, he concludes that it must have been the barbarian tribe, which resides on the other side of the mountain. For Vakir, this is a golden opportunity, even if he needs to use all his cards. He had been hiding his abilities from the Baskervilles. His mastery had already reached that of a master swordsman. Currently, he possesses the strength that the other students will only obtain in adulthood. And trusting in that, he advances and attacks the Cerberus with skill and mastery. He is sure he will defeat it, as it is injured. Vakir firmly believes that his weapon is more than enough to harm the Cerberus. But in a moment of carelessness, he gave the Cerberus an opening to use its claws, which broke his sword and hit him hard, throwing him away, only to be stopped by colliding with a tree. This was enough to make him lose consciousness. He feels his arm hurting thanks to the river sticks. His arm remained in place, for even weak, the Cerberus would surely have caused serious damage if it were someone else. Now more than anyone, he knows the danger he is facing. He knows it would be difficult to survive another attack. The best thing he can do now is the 36th stratagem. And so he does. If the Cerberus weren't injured, it would surely have caught him and torn him to pieces. Vakir runs as fast as possible, he will make it. If he reaches that place, he prepared. But if he is caught before, he is dead. Just a little more. Just a little more and he arrives. And almost like a miracle, he manages to arrive. The creature falls into his trap. This trap was planned thinking of a horde of hellhounds Vakir is surprised that it actually works against the Cerberus. Because it is a dog-type monster, it was effective. The trap contained spears with extracts of chocolate seeds spread on the tip. Even though this was a fatal poison for him, the high-level creature remained standing. And preparing for the final blow, he threw a spear at hit, but was soon ricocheted. However, the spear contained venom from the blood mamba snake, and after seven steps, as the rumors say, the poisoned creature will die, and so the three heads die. Now the concern is how to carry him. But before that, he remembers, Cerberus are guardian monsters, meaning they have the habit of protecting their territory. With that in mind, it is certain that there is a dungeon nearby that was being defended by it. Vakir then covers himself with the smell of the Cerberus, as this will allow him to avoid confrontation with most creatures. And following the traces he had left before arriving at Vakir, he finds the dungeon. And it seems he had been there in his past life, when he was 18, and it was empty. But now it's different. It is covered with the smell of corruption and mana. It certainly has not yet been explored. And without further ado, he advances for exploration. After walking a bit, he soon finds an illuminated entrance the inside of the dungeon. At the center lies a ruby, responsible for all this brightness. And upon further inspection, the skull of a human. At its feet lies what appears to be a note. The writer, stating that his real name no longer matters, refers to himself as. The purpose of this letter is to warn those who come after him. The legends of his family claim that this was an ancestral dungeon, and his younger brother, named Abel, decided to venture into it. They overcame numerous trials as they attacked the dungeon. They killed thousands of monsters and reached this stone chamber, where they faced the final puzzle. This puzzle trapped them there for a long time, a total of three years. Reading this, Vakir only thinks about how much they must have desired the treasures of the dungeon, and that the final enigma should have been it. What entered was one, but inside became two, but only one of them can leave. That's what was written on the stone. Continuing to read the letter with this ominous puzzle, he and his younger brother pondered for a long time, and both reached a single conclusion. He and his brother were twins, and when conceived in their mother's womb, they were only one. But when born, they became two, and therefore, to leave this dungeon with what they desire, they must become one again. This means that only one of them will be able to leave with what they came for. In the end, after a long battle, he killed his younger brother. Now only he was in the stone chamber. However, nothing had changed inside the chamber. For him, they had definitely become one, but he gained nothing from it. He fell into despair. He killed his younger brother. After an eternity of remorse, he decided to leave this place. And his message to any brave descendant who comes there was to say just one thing, to get out of that place immediately. Finishing reading, 
he realizes that something doesn't make sense. He got there, and he's not a twin. So Cain and Abel interpreted the enigma wrong. Reflecting on what was on the stone, he notices the real secret. Cain and Abel couldn't solve the enigma due to their own conflicts. But for Vakir, it was clear, the answer to the enigma is the dungeon itself. When he entered, he was one with the darkness. But the moment he reached the light of the stone chamber, he became two because of the ruby's light. So if everything becomes dark again, the answer to the enigma is his shadow. And with that, he sees the reason why the brothers killed each other. The relic of the demon cave. Only the Baskerville clan lineage can unsheathe Belzebu. Reading this, he then remembers he had already seen this sword in an illustration in a mythological book in his past life youth. The gluttony fly, Belzebu. The ancestral myths of unprecedented demons that invaded the continent. There were seven calamities, the demonic constellations. To stop the seven calamities, each of the leaders of the seven great clans was needed. At that time, the one the Baskerville clan leader faced was the gluttony fly, Belzebu. Its remains were subdued and sealed in Baskerville territory. However, no one believed in that legend in the present day. This legend was true, and in the future, this sword would fall into the hands of demons. But in this life, that will not happen. That said, he tries to draw the sword. However, it doesn't come out in his hands but goes into it. Obtaining this item was somewhat unexpected, but he just wonders how much stronger he can become in this. After obtaining the legendary sword, finishing there, there's nothing more to do but leave. That's what he was about to do until he suddenly felt dizzy. He then realizes that this thing in his hand wants something to eat. He is then directed by his hand to what seems to be the corpse of the first infernal dog he had killed. The creature in his hand then begins to suck his blood, as if it had been starving for a long time. Pausing to think, he realizes, could the situation of the dry trees and dead earth in this place have been caused by the absurd hunger of Belzebub? How much will it take to satisfy this thing? He wonders. He also remembers that Belzebu had the ability to take opponent's abilities for itself. It practically had the ability to steal infinite abilities, and those who had their abilities stolen ended up destroyed. But maybe three is the maximum it can steal from a corpse. Infernal dog hemorrhage is the ability he stole. It causes even the smallest scratches to expel an absurd amount of blood. Incineration and regeneration were also stolen. But the regeneration was stolen from the corpse of a rat that was under the Cerberus. And finishing preparing the demonic creature for the practical test, he finally relaxes. With all the young hunting dogs now gathered, the practical test comes to an end. The evaluation followed immediately. The corpses of the creatures were transformed into necklaces, shields, swords, etc. Then they were returned to them, and one of the corpses brought by one of the children shocked all the present Baskervilles. The news quickly reaches Hugo. It was reported that Vakir, accidentally, entered the unexplored area and hunted a Cerberus. Hugo is initially incredulous because, after all, Cerberus is a demonic creature that even the Guardian Knights have difficulty facing. It was also said that the creature was injured and poisoned, and when Vakir was questioned about it, he just returned to the dorm saying he was tired. At this moment, Hugo only admires him for his cleverness. Knowledge is power, and power represents your value, Hugo thinks. The butler is equally surprised but for a different reason, that the boy's talent comes from the Van family and not from the La or love family. He thought Hugo was also surprised for that reason, but he wasn't. He just says that he is different from other patriarchs. He does not care about lineages. All that matters is the talent and determination of the individual, regardless of whether they are the child of a noble or an impure woman. It is then that the butler reveals something we did not know until then. And he finishes by saying that even the weak can come from good lineages. Saying that, the butler wonders if he is talking about the second son he is training in isolation. With the conversation over, he sends for the protagonist. Having arrived, Hugo goes straight to the point and asks how he managed to kill the Cerberus. Vakir, without beating around the bush, says he simply gave it chocolate to die. And he adds, saying that because it's a dog type, chocolate is like poison to it. The butler just observes the conversation, but in his thoughts, he can hardly believe that this is a conversation between father and son, as they barely greet each other and go straight to questions and answers. Hugo continues now he asks why he didn't respond when asked about the details of the hunt. But in response to that, the protagonist just says, because he is not his master. He then asks, who is your master? And Vakir says it's him, the patriarch. Happy, Hugo says that, as a reward, the corpse of the demonic creature he caught will be entirely his, and that, for coming first in the practical test, he would guarantee a wish. And this was the part the protagonist most wanted to hear. And as a wish, 
He wants to enter the library of the 10,000 books. This is a huge place, located in the deepest parts of the main Baskerville castle. It is one of the largest libraries in the empire. In response to this, the Patriarch asks if Fakir knows that only the Patriarch, the Vice Patriarch, and the other members of the main house can enter there. Realizing that his request will probably be denied, he soon gives up. However, to his surprise, his request is accepted. Hugo, completely satisfied, also suggests that he read Baskerville Fencing Six Prey. Fakir soon begins to get nervous. Never has an illegitimate child been allowed to read beyond the fourth prey. However, he soon calms down. Because in the end, it's just the sixth prey. That's what he thinks. Hugo is only on the seventh prey, but in his past life, he had already managed to reach the ninth prey. However, Vikir will never forget the scorn he received for being an illegitimate child. In this life, he will surpass Hugo. What the protagonist aims for is the scripture of fencing that contains the true, pure essence of the Baskervilles. This scripture was only discovered in the future of his previous life and was written by the first patriarch of the Baskervilles, who killed the seven calamities. And he will make Hugo Le Baskerville deliver it into his hands. With the end of their conversation, Hugo wishes him luck in his future, thanking him. Vakir leaves. After some time, he heads to the library. Upon arriving, he is amazed. It's the first time he's seen it in person. There lies the scripture of all sorts of swordsmanship he once dreamed of learning. In the Baskerville clan, no matter how much mana you possess, if you're an illegitimate child, you won't learn a swordsmanship beyond the alluring prey. This rule ensures that the hunting dogs never turn their claws against the direct descendants, who will become the masters. Finding the sixth prey swordsmanship, he still can't believe that Hugo suggested he read this. Perhaps he doesn't believe he'll be able to memorize everything in a day. In his past life, he studied the theory of sword techniques from the first to the fourth. He did it like a maniac. He got to the point where he could guess the fifth prey. He never managed to learn it. But now he doesn't care about any of that. What he desires is an even higher level. And as he heads to another place, the guards are startled, thinking he's already leaving. They even think he might have forgotten something that they could fetch for him. However, he's really leaving already. But before that, he says he'll just skim through other scriptures. They can just ignore him and continue with their work. However, the place he's going to has nothing important. That's what the guards say. But the protagonist obviously didn't come here for nothing. Here lies a treasure they would never know existed. And after searching for a bit, he quickly finds it. Alluring prey. This is a basic scripture for the first claw, not even read by the children of the Baskerville clan. And because its pages are torn, there's no doubt that it's just any old scripture. But our protagonist knows very well that it's not like that. Before his death, his hunting unit found a strange relic inside the border dungeon. It was a piece of a Baskerville clan scripture. At that time, Hugo noticed something wrong with it and ordered a search through all 10,000 books in the library until the original book was found. This scripture was personally written by an ancient Baskerville, detailing the method of reaching the 10th prey. Consumed by this, Hugo sent the hunting dogs to find the six missing pages. It was then that he discovered that the remaining pages were hidden in each of the other seven great clans, which almost led him to declare war on them, as he sent the hunting dogs against anyone who resisted. And after much sacrifice, they managed to offer all the missing pages to Hugo. And the reward for all this was, remembering all this, Vikir becomes furious. Thanks to his efforts, Hugo managed to surpass the seventh prey and reach the ninth, using the hunting dogs as fuel. But that won't happen again. The one who managed to get all the pages for Hugo was none other than Vikir himself, and therefore, he remembers the contents of all of them. The reason he never went beyond the fourth prey was that he had never read the original text. In his past life, he was at the fourth prey level and was a high-ranked graduate in Aura. Reflecting on all this, he simply exclaims that he'll become as strong as he was in his past life, even before turning 15. Such is his motivation. And so, he spends the whole day there reading. With this, he memorizes the entire book, to the point of being able to recite it perfectly backward. He then notices that he no longer feels the presence of the guards. So, he prepares to unleash at least up to the fifth prey. Since his body is still that of a child, he'd hardly be able to go to the tenth. Focusing, he begins his new technique. He then attacks with the first, second, and fourth Baskerville prey. Before reverting in time, his previous life was very harsh. Even though he managed to achieve the highest aura rank, it was only with a lot of hard work. Yet, the main house always scorned him because he was unable to learn the appropriate swordsmanship for it. The only reason he, 
in his past life never reached the fifth prey or higher was because he was an illegitimate child. But this time it will be different. He won't live that kind of life again. So he achieves the fifth prey right there. However, it's not complete yet, but at least he managed to unleash it. A warm feeling permeates his heart with this achievement. He wanted to cry tears of joy for having reached the fifth prey. This was the first time in Baskerville's history that a hunting dog grew so fast and was aiming at his master's throat. Now he needs to increase his mana. He says he can even feel his core expanding. Bakir can feel that he went from being a high-level expert swordsman to a low-ranked graduate. The level he had only reached at 30 years old he has now achieved it at just 8 years old. A graduate swordsman is entirely different from an expert in terms of mana mastery. Their density increases, and their ability to change shape becomes less limited. His swordsmanship is also better than before, but he won't stop at just the fifth prey. Now, he can reach up to the tenth prey, a swordsmanship with infinite potential. Before, he only had the skinning fong technique, which allowed him to become stronger and faster. His growth limits were visible. Compared to that, the alluring prey is the perfect swordsmanship that combines attack and defense and has no growth limit. Vikir believes that if he concentrates, he can even face an intermediate level graduate. And he concludes by saying that if it's an assassination, he has a 100% success rate, but if it's a direct confrontation, the chances decrease by 50%. The problem for him now is how much strength he should reveal to Hugo. It can't be too much or too little, because he wants to keep receiving the benefits of his expectations. And to finish, he burns the Book of the Tenth Prey, thus destroying the chance for anyone else to learn beyond him. But to his dismay, the guards catch him in the act. Of course, he apologizes and says it was his carelessness. But the guards just say he doesn't need to worry, that it's their fault for not taking care of him properly. The protagonist then says they were all ordinary books. They shouldn't worry about it. And since there are more important things to do, Vakir proposes that they agree that it never happened. Admiring the kindness of their young master, they just thank him for it. And apologizing once again, he leaves the library, watching his back. The guards can only think of how good a person he is. Back in the patriarch's office, Hugo asks if his reading process was enlightening. The protagonist says it was, which obviously interests Hugo. He then asks what he felt and realized inside the library. In response to this, he says it was something warm and sharp and at the same time soft and malleable. Hugo and the butler are surprised and ask if he's talking about his aura. Aura in this world is basically proof that someone has truly entered the world of swords. Even prodigies who train relentlessly need to be at least 15 years old to achieve this feat, but Hugo soon calms down and tells himself that this would be impossible. He's only 8 years old, but just in case, he asks Vakir to show how it's done. The protagonist agrees, and they head to the training ground. Curiously, the butler asks how he intends to test Vakir's abilities. Hugo says he'll send an appropriate demonic beast for him, one that he left starving to make it more sensitive. So they bring an orc, a ranksy creature in distress. The people watching say this is overkill, that to face an orc, he should be at least 15 years old. But trusting the idea that if anything happens, the guardian knights will intervene, they calm down. Seeing that everything is ready, Hugo gives the signal to release the creature. Fueled by fury, it has already located its prey. But without losing his cool, Vakir remains calm. The creature advances, but he quickly cuts off one of its arms and then one of its legs. However, now it was for the orc, a monster specialized in rapid regeneration, to have healed. But due to his ability of infernal dog hemorrhage, he was prevented from activating his regeneration. All the spectators are astonished. How can an eight-year-old boy be capable of this? However, Hugo is not satisfied, and Vakir knows it. He wants Vakir to show what he learned in the library. Knowing this, he then displays his aura blade and finishes off the orc in the blink of an eye. Now, Hugo is truly surprised. What Vakir showed equals the aura of a low-level swordsman, and that would be impossible for an eight-year-old. The butler then congratulates the family head on his prodigy, and adds that even among all the families in the empire, there has never been a genius like this. But reluctant, Hugo says this was possible because the orc was a bit strange, as it didn't even stop its bleeding. That he only won because the orc was very weakened. But the protagonist suddenly approaches them and asks if there wasn't another creature stronger than an orc. The students who were already scared are now completely incredulous. The protagonist's idea is to reveal more of his strength. Enough so that, if lucky, 
his achievements will be recognized and he can separate from Hugo. For example, being sent to the jungle or entering the academy. In response to Vakir's request, Hugo simply agrees that the orc wasn't enough to satisfy his son's hunger and then asks to bring the individual from the barbarian tribe they had captured for experiments. The proto asks if he can start now and so he is ordered quickly heading towards the creature, which seems slow due to its size, reacts fast and delivers the first punch, but Vikir dodges and even when he had the option to attack, he decides not to, which Hugo thought was a great decision. The regenerative ability of trolls is incredible, so if you can't inflict a fatal wound in one blow, you would only be wasting energy. Based on this, what you have to do is strategize to hunt. The boys watching can only wonder what Vakir was planning. Would he tire the troll by dodging all the attacks? Would they be true geniuses like that? From Vakir's perspective, he could easily kill him if he revealed his true strength, but that would result in complications. So he needs to kill him as naturally as possible. One of his ideas is to use the troll's own strength against him, attacking him when he advances towards him. And so he does and cuts the troll, but it soon regenerates. This makes the audience discouraged, believing that it is indeed impossible for an 8-year-old boy to defeat a troll. But the proto knows this more than anyone. It would really be impossible to defeat him with just the first prey. Hugo noticing the same as the others watching, says Vakir can stop now, says continuing could be dangerous. But before finishing, the proto interrupts him. He says that if he doesn't kill him in his next attack, he gives up. He then continues and wonders, how much power should he reveal? But the answer to his question has already been decided. He will use enough to make it seem like he received divine enlightenment. Wondering how surprised Hugo will be, he strikes a fatal blow against the troll and decapitates it perfectly. And everyone, without exception, is shocked by the scene. An irregular had appeared. A week after the events, the protagonist complains because he can't stand eating this food anymore. Unlike the food, the situation around him has changed a lot. Everyone avoids even getting close to him, and from the battle against the troll, he gained a new ability, Ultra Regeneration. While lost in his thoughts, the triplets suddenly appear. He only asks if the beating they took was not enough. However, they just wanted to say how cool it was when he killed the Cerberus and the troll. But before he could question them about it, the butler also appears and warns him that he needs to go to the Patriarch immediately. A while later, it was possible to see a carriage arriving at the Baskerville family castle, and in the family Patriarch's meeting room, there was a man who was the leader of the Morg clan. His name was Adolf Morg. Initially, they were already discussing how this year's annual event had been a joint effort between the families. The patriarch even mentioned that the Morg clan children were very dramatic for complaining only about some scratches. Adolf, on the other hand, says that this may be because the Morg clan is prestigious and elegant. This was the current relationship between the prestigious magical clan, the Morg clan, and the Iron Swordsman clan, the Baskerville clan. But it wasn't always like this. Two generations ago, the Emperor said that magic and sword were complementary existences. With these words, they began a joint training process where only children between 8 and 15 years old participated. But the conflict began afterward because of rubies found in the territories, and gradually, the relationship between the leaders was distorted. But by orders of the Emperor, the training continued. Adolf compliments, saying he heard rumors about a genius emerging in the Baskerville clan, and he thanks him. This leaves Adolf somewhat confused since it's not normal for Hugo to praise a child like that. So Adolf reveals that his clan also had this luck, and he asks for Camus to come in. With that, the doors were opened. This was Camus the daughter of Adolf's eldest sister. He asks her to greet the clan leader, but she immediately asks if he's the thief who stole their ruby mine. This surprised the family leader. Furious, he asks, thief? Adolf tried to intervene, but the girl says that it was actually Uncle Adolf himself who said that, calling the Baskerville leader a pathetic bearded man a few hours ago. All of this leads Hugo to tell Adolf to educate his niece better, but the girl insists that the leader return the mine because she needs the rubies for her research. Hugo becomes furious and orders the girl to stop. Adolf intervened, asking if this is how he treats a child, even questioning if the Empire's sword saint is planning to oppress an eight-year-old girl, until suddenly someone says they think the Morg clan doesn't teach their children not to covet what belongs to others. It was the protagonist speaking as he entered through the door. The butler announces that young master Vakir is here, and Adolf examines the young man from afar. But when he realizes, his niece is no longer in his arms. She was now in front of Vakir, asking what he just said. It seems our protagonist recognized her. This is the Steel Blood Empress of the Morg clan, among all the archmages who came from the prestigious magical clan, 
She was the only one called the genius of all geniuses. She made history in her past life by impaling several enemies and forming a border, not to mention her stunning appearance, which led her to be called the Authority Avatar. The girl insisted on asking why the ruby mine is theirs when it belongs to the Morg clan. The first thing Bakir says is that she must have tried really hard to have traveled here just to throw a tantrum. Both leaders were impressed with such a response. Furious. She asked if he just said she was throwing a tantrum, and he says that's exactly it. Conjuring magic in her hands, she said she would teach him why the ruby mine belongs to the morgues, and the protagonist remained impassive. Some time later, a kind of city was formed. Everyone was surprised, the girl boasting that even an ignorant person like him would now understand. But the protagonist was surprised because he thought he would be attacked or something. But she simply made a model of the city with magic. She explains that on the border between the morgues and the Baskervilles, there is the this mine where high quality rubies come from. The problem is that the entrance is in Morg territory while the underground is in Baskerville territory. And as only they can enter, the cave belongs to them. She also says that they keep talking about territory invasion and don't even accept the offer to lease the territory, which makes Adolf say that his niece is very intelligent. Vakir says that the ruby ore is used as a magic ingredient, and this is not something the Baskervilles need. He says her desperation is because no one from Baskerville territory seems idiotic enough to lease their lands for mere change. This makes her say that he just said they have no use for the rubies, and he says yes. They only care about their territories, and that's why they're sending them away. After all, the only invaders here are them. This leaves her furious, trying to explain in a different way where she mentions that this is their land and that is her land. Stepping over the wall, she asks whose arm is it now. Vakir asks if she really wants to know whose arm it is after stepping to their territory. He quickly grabs the girl's arm, and happily says it's his now. This caught her off guard and left her blushing. Struggling she asks why she's his now, calling him an idiot, but he asks who said she would be his now, drawing his knife from his waist, which impressed both Adolf and the butler. He says he was saying that her arm is his. At that moment, the girl locked the bike tire. Even Hugo panicked at such an attitude from Vakir. Literally, the protagonist went all out. Realizing he wasn't joking, she starts screaming for help to her uncle. The furious man orders him to stay away from his niece. Vakir promptly obeys the man's order. The girl runs into her uncle's arms whimpering. The man quickly questions the situation to the patriarch of the Baskerville family, turning to Vakir saying he went too far, but Vakir just laughs and apologizes. As he twists his dagger, he says this kind of play is normal between him and his brothers. The old man, still furious, asks why such a toy exists. Vakir apologizes again saying it's just a little game they've played since they were kids in the Baskerville clan. Hugo asks if the head of the Morgue clan isn't being too protective intervening in children's play. Then he says he's thought of something for the the ruby mine situation and believes the morgue clan will like it too. The crying girl says she won't forgive the cure for what he did. The rogue protagonist just laughs. Finally, the friendly competition between the Baskerville clan and the morgue clan began. Children from 8 to 15 years old gathered in one place to test their skills. But this year all attention was focused elsewhere. This time someone from the prestigious Morg clan was on the battlefield known as Camus Morg. On the other side there was a swordsman of blood and iron from the Baskerville known as Vakir Van Baskerville. It seems there was a proposal from the Morg clan to have a duel between the two rising stars of the two clans. Camus warned him to prepare because she never goes easy in real battles. Then she quickly began to conjure a spell the people around were amazed. This was because Camus was doing a quadruple channeling, even being so young. The head of the Morg clan looked at Hugo, giving a mischievous smile, but Hugo didn't seem to care. At this moment, Camus cast four spells at once towards Vakir, which he easily dodged them all. After that, she tried to conjure an earth wall to stop Vakir's progress, but he kicked and passed through it very easily. At that moment, she began to wonder if this was the power of the Baskerville clan's Styx River. She closed her eyes waiting for the contact. But the contact didn't come, so she opened her eyes. Vakir was about to flick her head, but this flick was so strong it felt like a gunshot. The head of the Morg clan was startled by the boy's strength. Camus felt humiliated, and began asking if he was taking it easy on her. Vakir just mocked, asking if it still hurt. Then, he asked her to accept defeat before things could get worse. But furious, she conjured two earth walls at the same time. At that moment he thought he could just go around the walls, but decided he could play a little with her. And he crossed both 
walls with just one blow. His hand was almost touching the girl's face again when he asked whose hand she thought passed through this wall. Preparing for a new flick, he said it's definitely the strongest one. The bump on her forehead seemed bigger than before. She was crying in pain, and she began attacking Vakir with fire, this time very angrily. The boy knew he could kill her at any moment, but didn't know how to resolve the situation without causing harm. Until, looking at the boys behind him, he got an idea. Vakir understood that the two behind them were a wizard and a swordsman. They were competing to see if the boy could cut all the spells. Camus realizing Vakir wasn't paying attention to her, began to get even angrier. At this moment, the wizard was casting an even bigger spell, asking if the swordsman could cut this one too. This was the perfect moment for Vakir. He just pointed behind him saying she should cast the protection spell now. But I think it was already too late. The head of the Morgue clan panicked. The explosion was massive. At this moment, it wasn't possible to see anything on the battlefield. Morg shouted for the girl. She was in there, but didn't know what to do. Even though she had blocked the magic with magical protection, her clothes had burned. Her fear was that as soon as the smoke cleared, people would see her half naked. So she would surely be humiliated. At this exact moment, someone threw a piece of clothing over her. It was Vakir who did it, telling her to put it on. Crying, she asks what he'll do without a shirt, but he says he doesn't care about such nonsense. She was completely embarrassed, wondering why he's being so nice to her, until he realizes his arm is bleeding, and it's probably due to a fragment of the sword from that knight who still had an aura. When the dust finally began to settle, it was possible to see the two in there. Finally, the head of the morgue clan breathed a sigh of relief. The people in the audience couldn't tell who won since Vakir was bleeding, but they soon changed the subject, saying that child's physique was simply impressive for his age. Both were incredible talents for an eight-year-old. Sometime later, in the corridors of the Baskerville family castle, Hugo was asking how his duel against the daughter of the Morg clan went. He just said it was fun, and he understood the significance of the event. Then, Hugo asks, why didn't he attack directly? Vakir says he hesitated because he had never faced a girl before. Then, the man says that hesitating in battle will only get him hurt, and says that this wound should be his lesson. Vakir was impressed with Hugo being concerned about him. In his past life, Hugo had always been a cold and brutal entity, which they said was due to the the loss of his first wife and his eldest son in a horrible way. Along the way, Hugo asks, what does he think of the ruby mine? Vakir says it's better to leave it to them, making Hugo ask why. The boy says their clan's task is to develop and expand borders, so they should use the Morg clan to minimize the damage they would have with development. Hugo is completely happy, saying this is definitely the right answer. After obtaining the rights to the ruby mine, the Morg clan will put a considerable number of people on site. And this means they'll only need to provoke the demonic creatures and barbarians there. And so they can deal with all the problems at once. With a wicked smile, he says the rubies will become even more valuable bathed in the blood of the Morg clan, and then they will regret stepping into their territory. He also praises Vakir, saying the boy's strategy matched 90% of his plan. But that was simply because he knew that was the choice Hugo made in his past life. Vakir also says they should keep an eye on the Morg's move movements, but Hugo said he doesn't need to worry about that. Until, turning the corner, they finally met someone, this was the head of the Morg clan, asking if they could talk before they leave. The girl was behind the man, completely embarrassed. Hugo went straight to the point asking what he wanted and he says he has only one important matter to discuss. Renting the territory is just one of the many issues he needs to resolve. This made Hugo ask what he would gain by opening his territory to them. Mord gets straight to the point and proposes. How about an engagement? At first, the old man suggests that they should unite the Morg and Baskerville clans through a boy and a girl. Asking, what does he think of the eldest son of the Baskervilles and his niece, the eldest daughter of the Morgues? He says from her appearance to even her intelligence, she has no flaws. That she would be a great companion for the successor of the Baskerville clan. Hugo says his eldest son will turn 25 soon and the age difference is too high. The old man said he didn't care about the age difference, until the girl interrupted them, saying she won't marry anyone weaker than her mother. The old man laughed, saying if it's to marry her to someone stronger than her mother, she'll remain single forever. Then she says the age difference can't be that big and she wants someone her age or even younger. Hugo starts getting furious, saying this isn't a buffet here. She says she knows, but she won't just go around eating anything they offer her until, completely flushed, she looks to the side, surprising Hugo and the head of the Morg clan. She was looking at Vakir. At this moment, the old man started sweating, then whispered to his niece that he's not pure blood and is a bastard son. 
even claiming that a mixed blood dragon is just a mongrel regardless of being a dragon. Hearing those words started to make Hugo completely furious. Was he starting to have affection for Vakir? Then he says that individual's thoughts should matter in the engagement, and asks what his son thinks about it. The girl was nervous and embarrassed waiting for the answer. Vakir just observed the situation. Then he says something that shocked everyone, they were incredulous with his response. He says loudly that he'll only do it if it's an order from his family. The old man was furious thinking he was being too insolent with the only daughter of the direct lineage of the Morg clan. The girl, on the other hand, started to wonder if he really didn't like her or was just being shy. At this moment, Hugo asserts that being from the direct lineage means nothing to the Baskervilles. Sometimes even the L family has inferior children, while the Van family has the superior ones. The old man thinks for him to say something like that the boy must really be very valuable. So he gets close to Vakir analyzing him completely. The boy also knew well who Adolf Mord was. A sixth circle master who is an extremely strong man in the upper echelons of the Mord clan, an elite and prestigious magical clan. Then the old man says he's not necessarily talking to him, but says that just having talent is nowhere near good enough to be Camus' husband. Putting his his hand on Vakir's shoulder, he says this marriage was proposed by his clan and it wasn't his idea, even saying he doesn't believe even Baskerville's own legitimate children are good enough for Camus. The old man was putting force to make Vakir bow down, but it wasn't working and the boy wasn't even responding. Then the old man asks why Vakir isn't responding to him? The boy simply says he stopped listening because the old man said he wasn't talking to him. Yeah. Camus thought how he could speak so boldly in front of her uncle while Hugo just laughed. The old man also started laughing crazily, then asked if he could have the opportunity to talk more deeply with this kid outside in the training field. Hugo just asks if the great mage of the empire is really planning to interrogate an eight-year-old kid. The old man just says he's not asking for this favor as a representative of the Mord clan but as a little girl's uncle. But it seemed like the girl herself didn't want that. At this moment her uncle was already very furious and ordered his niece to be quiet. The old man reinforced the request and Hugo said if he insists so much then so be it. We were now in the training field outside, the only ones watching were Hugo and Camus. The old man says he wanted to test what he was made of, so he asked to show everything he has. Vakir says it's okay, but thinks the old man faints if he really showed everything. Then conjuring a magic the old man says he'll help him. It was possible to see he was making a jar. The girl at this moment was surprised that the old man was perfectly harmonizing fire, earth, and water magic. Soon a jar with water inside was formed, then he said he'll do it with a jar filled with water on top of his head, and if Vakir manages to drop a single drop of water, the boy will be victorious. Vakir thinks Adolf Morg is a strong man he couldn't even scratch in his past life, but now it's a great opportunity to test his new powers. He's also sure Hugo allowed all this thinking the same way. At this moment the old man ordered him to come at him. The boy knew he didn't need to go all out, and just had to show enough skill for Hugo to be happy. Camus from the audience says Vakir shouldn't run towards his uncle like that. Suddenly Vakir was impressed. The old man had conjured a barrier that the boy couldn't pass, saying shield magic is the best possible answer against the swordsman. Since Vakir didn't have an exceptional aura yet, it would be difficult for him to pass at this moment. Then conjuring a beautiful fire magic, Adolf says now it's his turn to attack. Several fire spears came from all possible sides towards the boy. Camus was furious saying this was too much and her uncle never used this even against her. The old man somewhat sadly just asks which side Camus is on right now. Hugo, on the other hand, noticed the spells were still slow enough to dodge, and it seemed he wouldn't need to intervene. At this moment Vakir noticed all this wasn't a big deal, thanks to the fact that he regressed to his eight years and has the experience from before coming back. He'll surely make the old man drop his guard. Maybe he can even kill the man. Vakir slashed with all his might towards the barrier. Adolf said he could try even hundreds of times, but his sword couldn't break his shield. But Vakir seemed not to care. Repeatedly he struck the barrier in the same spot, cracks could be seen on it. The old man at this moment said he seemed like a well-calibrated machine, hitting the same point several times. And the boy's fencing surely deserves recognition. However, there was a problem. It was obvious his sword wouldn't hold up against a barrier of this grade. So tauntingly, the old man says he should have considered the durability not only of the shield but also of his sword. The old man kept rambling a lot of nonsense while Hugo and Camus were completely impressed. While the old man said he had talent, but there was still much to improve to become his niece's fiancé, he felt something dripping on his forehead. A piece of the broken sword had pierced the jar, and it was leaking a lot of water. With that, the boy says he 
believes that's enough, but tauntingly asks if he should spill more water from the jar. I guess at this moment the girl fell completely in love. She started thinking this means they should get married now. It was at this moment that Hugo began laughing thinking that was certainly no coincidence. The Kier Van Baskerville, his new non-direct lineage son. Maybe he's raising a hunting dog much more cunning and powerful than he was thinking. With that, seven years have passed, and we were now at the Baskerville training field. There was a furious monster in this place. Several children were there to face it. The monster came running towards them, and the children jumped to confront it head on. But it wasn't easy at all to defeat this creature. In fact, many of the children were thrown flying from there. This man here was the family's guide dog. He was explaining that they must make a decision immediately even if that's to flee, and they mustn't be greedy trying to hit the vital points. The triplets made a simultaneous attack. They were much stronger than last time, even managed to deal significant damage to the creature. But soon the creature recovered. However, all the children were working together to win, so the end was inevitable. The man started applauding, saying they did well. Now all the young masters are low-level expert swordsmen, and even fully learned the first grip of Baskerville fencing, thus ending the long seven-year training they had. The man also says that the ox bear they faced was far from the strongest, and even he couldn't defeat a strong and old ox bear alone. He wanted to convey to everyone that the creature they faced today was far from the strongest. So he says that death is always closer than they think and they must overcome it with their talented blood. Saluting, he says he concludes his teachings and congratulates everyone on their graduation. Everyone salutes in respect to their teacher. Some time later the children were discussing which order of knights they would follow, since there are seven orders of knights within the Baskerville family, namely guarding, investigating, protecting, assassinating, suppressing, confronting directly, etc. Until suddenly they begin to wonder where that person is going? Of course, they were talking about none other than Vakir Van Baskerville, the prodigy boy of this generation. Vakir alone killed an ox bear bigger than theirs, besides being a high-level expert swordsman and even reaching the third grip of the Baskerville. But in Vakir's head at this moment, he thought all this took longer than he planned. In fact, he was currently a graduated swordsman of intermediate ranking who was on the fifth grip and it took seven whole years to happen. Of course, he was already above the level he was before his regression in time if considering only the fencing level, but still his growth is slower than he planned. Until someone called for him. This was a butler Barrymore warning that the head of the family was looking for the young master Vakir. Happily, the man says it seems the boy's position has been decided. Then the moment arrived. Vakir greeted the head of the family saying it's been a long time and asked asked how he has been, but soon noticed something wrong with the man, and immediately asked what was that scar on his nose. Hugo says that, while facing the barbarian tribe at Mount Rouge, he was attacked by a barbarian who was very skilled with a bow. The Kier asked if he managed to catch the woman who did this to him. Hugo says no, but at least made a scar just like that on that damned woman's face. So, changing the subject, he congratulates Vakir for finishing his education. Of course. The boy thinks and begins to think about the past. At this time in his past life he became an apprentice knight for the Pitbulls and was sent to Mount Rouge for 21 months to face countless life and death situations. He was discarded as a useless dog destined to go to the front line. The children of the Baskerville family are divided into elites and disposable after they turn 15. While the disposables die in battle, the elites learn about politics and administrative functions. There is something to bridge the gap between elites and battle-forged disposables, and that is the fifth grip of Baskerville fencing. It was also for this reason that his fencing was stuck at the fourth grip in his past life. So, at this moment, he thought it was impossible for Hugo to let him, a bastard son, take the elite course. But to his surprise, Hugo says that he must be a boy who can manage and legislate within the Baskerville family territories, upholding justice. In short, he would be responsible for both big and small matters within his family. Vikir was incredulous that Hugo would let him, a bastard son, become an elite? Hugo says what he has achieved puts him at least a decade ahead of other geniuses, and that's why he's giving him proper treatment. Now he will be the vice consul of a city called Underdog. Bakir will fulfill his father's wish, but says he wants to say something first. In summary, Hugo had promised a reward for excelling against Adolf Morg, and Vakir would like to receive this reward now. He would like to borrow that. The butler was surprised by the request. Vakir reinforces by saying that if the request is too complicated, then Hugo doesn't have to fulfill it. But stamping the paper, Hugo says it's not that difficult. He will trust that his son won't do anything ridiculous. The boy says he won't do anything that will cause him worries. But obviously he couldn't get used to Hugo calling him his son so openly like that, 
and even accepting a request from him. The butler was accompanying him on the way back, until he calls for Vakir, saying he needs to tell him something. He says the family leader values the young master very much. The man not only didn't immediately put him in real battles but practically gave him the position of consul in the city of Underdog, as the consul's position is currently unoccupied. This shows that Hugo values him immensely, but furious, Vakir replies that he will only get it if he can fulfill his duties as vice consul. In other words, he doesn't care about his current job. It's not like it will erase his memories from his mind. He still remembers the feeling of his head being chopped off on the guillotine. Furious, he affirms in his mind that he will make Hugo Le Baskerville go through the same thing. Now we are in Baskerville territory, more specifically in Underdog. An old man was warning that the new vice consul arrives tomorrow, so they must make sure to leave everything clean, and they should also be very careful since the man is coming from the main castle, so they must take special care. One of the employees was apprehensive about what the new vice consul would be like, until the other says he's just a 15-year-old kid. They were already mocking the new vice consul when someone passed in front of them. The boy quickly held him saying he's not allowed to be walking around like that. Vakir turns around furiously ordering the man to take his hands off him. Quickly he presents a paper that leaves them both dumbfounded. Finally they understood that the boy in front of them was the new vice consul, ordering them to bring some alcohol and women immediately. All because he will need to throw a party soon. Both were very surprised by the request of the new vice consul. Some time later the banquet was ready. There were several happy people talking everywhere. This man named Chihuahua Bass Baskerville was the one who managed Underdog and was currently in a stomach-turning situation. He couldn't believe that the new vice consul was throwing a party on the first day he took his position, quickly deduced that this person was outrageous. They were already going through difficulties because the previous consul had accepted bribes. So manager Chihuahua was furious saying that if he wants to sink the city, then let him. When Vakir appears behind him furiously asking if he is the manager, the man was in complete panic, but still they introduced themselves. The first thing our protagonist protagonist noted was that Chihuahua didn't have a middle name, which means he is someone outside the clan. In other words, they are simply employees and have no blood relationship. And surprisingly Vakir says he likes that. The man was surprised to hear this. Vakir says that because Chihuahua was born and raised here, he must know the situation of this city well. So he plans not to interfere with the man's work and hopes he will continue doing his job without problems. At first, the manager didn't quite understand the situation, even thought he was being insulted in some way. But but it didn't make sense for this man to be here while he was throwing a party. Vakir says there's no problem with federal laws, but there are some strange points in the judicial system, which impresses Chihuahua for him to read all this in such a short period. Our protagonist says the problem with the city of Underdog is that there are several black market businesses running and the economy is above the law. This problem won't be solved just by stopping their operations. They will have to remove the main leaders of these businesses. In summary, the role of the vice consul is to create laws and enforce them, and he also has to respect the laws created before his. However, he will add a new law to these existing ones. He intends to end the businesses of these criminals in a week, and if he wants to create a law and enforce it, obviously he'll need a reason, even when people are doing something illegal. This is because he is still young and is a rookie who was supposed to arrive only tomorrow, so to convince them he will need to do some things. To summarize, with all this, he will throw a mountain of crap to attract the flies. The manager begins to get very worried about the mentality of the new vice consul. Then the next day on the main street of Underdog, there were several dissatisfied people on the street. Vakir was right in front of them ready to give a speech. It seems that the new vice consul stayed all night there, and this gathered many people around him, until finally he starts speaking and introduces himself as the newly appointed vice consul. Some think he's too young, others think he's cute, and there were also those who thought he was just a brat. Vakir starts by saying that everyone must have read the public notice posted here and these are the laws in force. Nothing new has been added to them. Even though the vice consul has changed, these autonomous laws remain in force, and they should be kept that way. Quickly the disgruntled population began to mock the situation. The manager Chihuahua gets furious asking if they forgot who they're talking to. The new vice consul was from the main castle of the Baskerville clan. Quickly tempers calmed down and Vakir understood the situation. Then he grabbed an iron rod with his hand, which made the whole population worried. And with all his strength, he pierced the ground. Everyone panicked. The boy had pierced the ground very easily with that iron stake, and said that with his authority as vice consul he will be announcing a new law, a very special one. He says the special law of Vakir paragraph 1, 
Article 1. He will give 100 million gold to whoever can remove this. Both the high-ranking staff and the population were incredulous about this. They couldn't believe that the man just announced he'll give 100 million gold. But they would have to remove an iron stake. The law stated that whoever removed the pole would receive the 100 million in gold coins, which was the equivalent of four years' salary for an average person. No one could believe what they were hearing. The vice consul asked if really no one would want the 100 million. As there was no response, he changed the law again, stating that whoever removed the pole would now win 1 billion coins. With that, even laughter was heard. One of the citizens asked him to stop joking, since 1 billion isn't pocket change. Chihuahua was already going crazy. Vikir, realizing that no one would try, did something that shocked the entire population. He changed the law to 10 billion for whoever removed the pole. This was the equivalent of 400 years salary for an average person. Vikir was getting furious, as no one was speaking up. The problem was that this seemed surreal to the eyes of the population. They quickly began to whisper and speculate about what would happen to anyone who tried. Looking at the vice consul's sword, they presumed they would be executed for greed. No one dared to do such a thing. Vikir was about to ask again if no one would try to remove the pole, when someone raised their hand. A humble-looking little girl asked if she could try. One of the men, knowing she was the flower girl named Judy, warned her not to go there as she would be attacked. But the little girl said her mother was sick and she needed to do something. She also asked that if something happened to her, the man in front of her should take care of her mother. The man was speechless at the girl's words. She was now face to face with the vice consul of the city, wondering if she would really be killed by the man. Vikir, on the other hand, just pointed and told her to pull. The girl squatted down, holding onto the pole, putting some of her strength into it, she removed it so easily that she was incredulous. People couldn't believe what they were seeing. The girl herself thought it was too easy to remove and should have been impossible. Vikir, with a bloodthirsty look, reached for his suit. The girl thought she would be executed, but she was soon surprised by the sound of coins. Vikir was giving the girl a total of 100 million, saying that's how it would start. She took the bag of money without understanding the situation, asking where the girl's house was. Vikir said that since 10 billion would be too heavy, he would have it delivered to her house and also provide guards to protect her. Touching the little girl's head, he said that this is how the law works and it should be upheld from now on. Chihuahua lived up to its name as a dog and couldn't close its mouth. The entire population of the small town was motionless in disbelief. The example given today served as an opportunity for Vikir's special law to become more popular than the Basker family's law itself. The population understood that if they break the law, punishment will occur. But if they follow it, they will be rewarded. Since the announcement of Vikir's special law, the city's crime rate has halved. Chihuahua was crying, saying he would follow Vikir for the rest of his life. But he only did something similar to what Camus did in his past life. But the biggest problem begins now as they have to recover the hole that the 10 billion left in the budget. Vikir knows where the illegal organizations are and intends to confiscate all the dirty money. Chihuahua asks how he knows all of this. Vikir says he can sense it. But of course, this is related to his past life. While our little Chihuahua dog was impressed, Someone entered through the door reporting that a certain committee has requested an interview. Just as Vakir planned, the city's nobles who only eat and sleep now want to see him. Chihuahua quickly said the names of all the families belonging to this committee, even saying that it's just a common social club. However, it seems they have something to say about Vakir's special law. The boy simply says that the flies have finally started to smell the sewer, giving a little smile. He says that in this case they should start eradicating the pests that only take advantage of the city. Now we switch to a luxury club hotel within the city of Underdog. In the deepest part of this hotel, there is a VIP room that costs 10 million gold to spend a few hours there, and a party is happening now. The participants were the seven people who were part of the committee that invited Vikir. All of them were children of the native clans within the Baskerville territory. At this very moment, they were building a tower with alcoholic bottles that cost 100 million gold each. One of the guys even says that the vassals can drink the spilled drink on the table and they thank him for that. They were all happy that their money was endless and all thanks to the Baskervilles. They also had a slave trade and used barbarians who were caught in the Baskerville family's territory expansion. They were all laughing because they had more luxury than in the capital and still were protected by the main family. A blonde guy even said that the Baskervilles are their hunting dogs 
to the point of exterminating the entire Mesomedrano clan just for a few lies they told, which led to the downfall of one of the eight clans, resulting in having only seven now. Soon the vice consul's topic came to the table. Judging by the age and the fact that the guy threw a party as soon as he arrived, they assumed they would get along with the boy. The initial idea was to throw a party with the most expensive drinks, and then make him pay for everything. Then they would say it was a joke so that the boy would be indebted to them. At this moment, one of the vassals announces that the girls have arrived. When suddenly they notice someone strange, there was a man among them who was not invited to the party. The butler immediately grabbed the boy by the hair, but in the next instant his arm seemed like a boomerang. Another man nearby asked who the boy who just entered was. He said his name was Vakir Van Baskerville. The surprised man that the vice consul was in the room asks what brought him here. Vakir says they invited him, so he came. Nervously laughing, the men said they were impressed with Vakir's speed in getting things done. Suddenly they turned to each other and started whispering about putting the drinks on the vice consul's tab. But completely furious, Vakir touches the table, and using resonance on it, he knocks down the gigantic tower made with alcoholic beverages worth millions of gold coins. At this moment, the blonde guy understood one thing. He understood that the 15-year-old boy in front of him was at least on the graduated level to use resonance. The nobles began to ponder if it was possible to defeat this boy. But but soon realized there was no way to do so. Then Vikir approached one of them, which startled him. Without needing to ask anything, the man began to hand things over, saying they would pay for the drinks. Vikir said of course they would pay, or were they thinking of throwing the bill at him after enjoying the little party? Realizing they messed up, the nobles started saying they just wanted to test the new vice consul. Everything they did was to see if he would resist temptations easily. Giving a punch to the stomach of one of the nobles, Vikir said a master is allowed to test his little dog, but a dog can never test its master. He said the people here don't seem to have any fear because they have a bit of money and power, but that's only because they haven't experienced true terror yet. So he asked if they knew why the guy under his foot ended up like that. Because if they don't know, they'll have the same fate. The blonde nervously smiled and said he knew the reason. But if they know, that means they need a good beating. Everyone revolted, saying he wouldn't get away with it. But Vikir was already in front of him, saying kidnapping, illegal slave trafficking, and even disrespect against the Baskerville clan. They committed many dirty deeds here in the city. Then he started hitting them all, saying there's no way to tame an animal without teaching it a lesson first. It's time to punish the little dogs who aren't afraid of anything. Sometime later, we were in the corridors of a prison. Chihuahua couldn't believe what he was seeing. The blonde was shouting that he would tell his father about all this, and that Vakir would never be forgiven. Chihuahua, seeing the man's despair, asked why Vakir beat them so much, even saying he should have held back a little. But Vakir told him not to worry because he hadn't even started yet. The municipal leaders should prevent corruption and improve life in the region. But they have become so corrupt that they now covet the power of the Baskerville clan. Seeing that they want to retaliate only proves they haven't learned their lesson. When the sun sets today, Vakir will execute them all. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Old Chihuahua was asking if this was true, when the boy said he wouldn't just kill them, but everyone related to them. The prisoners began to apologize and beg for their lives, saying they would give money. Chihuahua just asked if Fakir thinks these people's clans will let him do this. Probably, he will lose total support in future negotiations and they may even try to retaliate. But the clans can't complain if these people have connections with the city's criminal organizations. And if they don't have evidence, they will create some. Then Vakir begins to list what they are accused of, starting with kidnapping and trafficking of women. There was also bribery, threats, extortion, robbery, and murder of officials. The blonde starts saying he never did that, and will accept any punishment if there is evidence. Vakir says he speaks as if he were guilty and had gotten rid of the evidence. The man seemed not to want to tarnish the reputation of his clan even if he were killed. At this moment, Someone arrived behind Vakir calling for him. The boy was waiting for this man's arrival. He seemed to carry a strange bag, smiling broadly, saying he brought what he was ordered to bring. Vakir thanked the man for his good work. What he brought was a bag with various tools, but the man said he had been torturing for over 30 years and had never seen tools like these before. Vakir said they were common where he came from. This made the torturer ask if the vice consul came from hell or somewhere similar. Laughing, Vakir just asked if he had the desire to learn some new tricks. The man said he would have to decline because even he would vomit seeing these tools being used. I Vakir learned several things in his past life thanks to the interrogations he had to do on demons. Taking off his coat, he asked the guests, where is their conviction that they would never speak about their crimes? Smiling, 
He begged the prisoners not to say anything because he intended to relive the memories very slowly. This way, rumors spread quickly, the seven scoundrels who lived in luxury and crime were arrested together. This became the talk everywhere, with people saying they wouldn't escape considering the personality of the new vice consul. But there were also those who said they would get away with it because they were children of the native clans. In the end, everyone knew that the punishment for these crimes, according to the law, was death. But no one believed he would execute these people. The public opinion was divided between who would win this dispute. It was a power game between the new politician and the native clans. But it would probably end quickly if the native clans bowed to him, even just a little. So as predicted by the public, all the native clans sent a small apology gift to the new vice consul. The local powers decided to bow. The trash that was arrested would be released without further problems, and they would receive a mild scolding from their parents. Or at least that's what everyone thought would happen. On that day, seven heads were displayed in the center of the town square. The seven heads were covered in salt and adorned with terrifying expressions. I like it, Kaji. As if they had been experiencing terrible pain until the moment of their deaths. What was displayed above their heads detailed the crimes they were executed for. The population was completely terrified. Bakir, on the other hand, said this should not be a surprise to anyone since the laws already existed. But the fact that the criminals who were punished were famous native nobles is what will bring about change. After the nobles hear this declaration of war, they will surely plot something and when that happens, it will only end when one side is completely eliminated. This city is about to undergo a bloodbath. Bakir looks at Chihuahua and tells him to prepare because he will be part of the next operation. He doesn't understand the situation, but soon we cut to another location with Chihuahua wearing a mask. Looking back, he asks if this will really be their plan. Bakir just asks if the man doesn't believe in him. But it's not that he doesn't believe. It's just that it seems too crazy to do this. Here it was possible to see people dragging cages. Women pulling slaves. Everyone was going into a tent. With them were several slaves. Bakir's plan was to sell himself as a slave to the nobles. Soon, a masked man was announcing that the circus was about to begin. At this moment, he was inspecting the identity of Chihuahua, who was posing as the Mablank family. After checking the certificate, the man questioned if Mablank came here to make a sale. But looking at the merchandise the man brought, he was immediately impressed. Mablank had brought a black-haired, white-eyed slave, which would surely fetch a good price. Now inside the circus, the presentation was beginning, the entire audience murmuring things about slaves and luxury. Then the presenter announced they would start with a product that was hunted. This was the A-ranked demonic beast with 19 hearts, called Murcielago. Saying that everything could be utilized from the animal, the presenter started with a bid of 100 million, quickly offers surpassed 200 million, ending up being sold for 250 million. Then there was a slave being sold for 200 million, another for 100 million, until one of the vassals alerted the presenter what the next item would be, which left him astonished saying they shouldn't blame him if he couldn't sell this. Then he announced that now they would have a special slave brought directly from the jungle. This was a slave who came from the battle tribe in the Rouge Mountain jungle, a barbarian from the Balak tribe. The man announced it would be fun to tame a wild slave, but seeing that nobody showed much interest, he started the bids at 5 million. Nobody in the audience spoke up, prompting him to lower the price to 3 million. As there was still no reaction, the man said they would accept the risks and sell for just 1 million this time. But even at such a low price, the audience showed no interest. So the masked man asked them to remove her from the stage. The furious slave tried to react, but was soon knocked out by the brute. Apologizing, the man said there was a little incident and to compensate them, he would now send in the best product they have at the auction today. When the slave stepped onto the stage, it was already possible to see the happiness on the nobles' faces. Who was on the stage now was Vikir van Baskerville, but it was obvious that they didn't know that. The man announced that the product was special because it had rare black hair and red eyes, and was so obedient that they only needed to handcuff him, and nothing more. Without even giving the initial bid, a noblewoman in the audience announced a bid of 600 million. Another stepped in front saying he would pay 800 million, which made the woman ask why he wanted a male slave. They began to argue over the slave, when another person stepped forward saying they would pay 900 million, until someone raised their sign saying they would pay 6 billion for the boy. Even the presenter was surprised by this exorbitant amount. The audience realized that the one bidding so high was Baron Gambino from the Granary Territory. There are rumors that this man recently absorbed some illegal funds 
and his influence has grown immensely. His vassal questions if he isn't paying too much, but the man says that if he resells later in the capital, he will make a huge profit. She insists that it is still a very high value and that they would have to maintain his body's purity, which made the Baron yell at her to shut up. Cinderwendy couldn't complain since she was accepted by the Baron when she had nowhere else to go. At this moment, the presenter warns that if there is no counterproposal, then it will be sold. Vikir went towards the man, thinking he had made a good deal. He immediately warned that the boy was now his, and not to be afraid because they would soon play a lot. Vikir just raises his arm towards the man, who asks if he wants his handcuffs removed. But the boy says he doesn't need to do that, bursting the handcuffs right in front of the man. Heading towards the Baron, he explodes the floor with just one stomp. Furious Vikir says that if he really wants to play, then they will start now. Grabbing what I think is the man's Australian parakeet, the boy says they will play shield and spears. Vikir would be the spear and the man the shield and if the shield survived, the man would win. The Baron in desperation orders Cindy to call the guards, but it seems it was already too late. The man was going to have a nice eternal nap. Removing the fake hair, the woman finally realized who the man in front of her was. He was the vice consul of the city, named Vikir Van Baskerville. Chihuahua noticed that her master would do something great again today. The boy announces that the name, Circus, given to this place today was worthy of what would happen. Smirking maliciously, Vikir warns that no one who is here in this place will leave in scathed today. The presenter, understanding the situation, orders all the guards to kill the unarmed boy. Three were coming at once, Vikir simply draws his devouring sword, and with a small gesture beheads everyone around him. Noticing the red aura around the boy, the masked one realized that he was a graduate, and that this was impossible. Vikir was heading towards the largest of the guards who had an iron ball in his hand. He tried to attack the boy with the iron ball, but in the next instant everything had been split in two. Even though he is a Baskerville, how is it possible for someone so young to be a graduate? Graduates have such great combat strength that they represent entire nations. Chihuahua was distracted by the boy's immense power, until someone drew Vikir's attention asking him to look in his direction. The presenter had a knife to the vice consul's right arm, or ordering him to surrender. As the boy showed no reaction, the man began to tighten the blade, until something surprised Vikir. Chihuahua was saying that the boy should do what he has to do and that she would rather die than hinder her master. Vikir laughed saying he finally found someone loyal. Vikir was relaxed because he had received a secret letter from the patriarch before leaving the Baskerville mansion. He had a whistle in his hand, which panicked everyone around. Vikir put the whistle in his mouth and blew with all his might, to the point of hurting the noble's ears. Chihuahua and the masked one watched very apprehensively. After blowing the whistle, Vikir remained standing still in the center of the stage. The man, realizing that nothing happened, started laughing saying he blew it just to scare them. But the man had no idea that a knife at this moment had already pierced his throat and he was dead. It was so fast that he managed to see the scene of his own death before finally falling lifeless to the ground. I don't feel so good. There was a man behind him who was responsible for this. Chihuahua was greatly startled by this situation happening right in front of him. One of the guards tried to attack the man from the side, but without even moving, he unleashed an absurd sequence of blows towards his opponent, causing red ink to spray everywhere. Bikir was finally satisfied with the situation. Several men were emerging on the scene, quickly filling the entire arena. They all had bloodthirsty red eyes. The auction guards were hoping they weren't who they thought they were. The woman knew these were the knights known as the cruelest in the entire empire, the expert killers. There are rumors that all 100 knights comprising this force are of graduated level. They are the Baskerville's pit bulls, men capable of destroying the entire continent if ordered to. The woman named Cindy realized that once these men set foot in this circus, there was no longer any chance of anyone here leaving this place alive. She would be the next to be executed right now. If Vikir hadn't intervened, ordering not to eliminate this woman, the pit bull steps back bowing to his master. The boy orders that they can bite and kill all who are not lying down, but if they move even the slightest, they must die too. This was the request Fakir had made that day. He asked Hugo to command the pit bulls. At this moment, the cleanup of the area had already begun. One of the nobles, noticing a pit bull looking at him with a bloodthirsty gaze, begins to say that the man can handcuff him, but calmly the man says they don't carry things like handcuffs, and he simply turns the man into a wheelchair user in the same instant, saying that those who are sentenced to death won't need legs. Damn! 
Soon, a gigantic man appears behind Vakir calling him nephew, asking him what he thinks of his dogs. The boy simply says he is satisfied. This was Boston Terrier LeBaskerville, the commander of the Pit Bulls Knights. The man was now examining the boy from head to toe, thinking he now knows why Hugo had so much interest in this boy. Even though he was only 15 years old, he was monstrously intelligent and clever. Boston asks if he wouldn't like to join the Pit Bulls, but the boy simply ignores him. Then he withdraws, saying he has important matters to attend to now. Noticing he was ignored by the boy, he becomes even more interested in having him on his team. Vakir was now elsewhere. He was walking through the auction warehouse. Soon he found the vault where all the money paid by the nobles was kept. He thought he didn't want to increase the Baskerville's wealth until he looked to the side and saw something that caught his attention. Removing the cloth covering the area, he was surprised. The elven slave from the Balak clan was inside the cage completely battered and weakened. Would Vakir help this girl? I like it, Kaji. Of course, our protagonist wouldn't fail to help if given the chance. So taking a potion from his belt, he pours it into the elf's mouth. Quickly it's possible to see that the potion started to take effect. Then she opened her eyes, startled, recoiled to the back of the cage while Vakir asked why she's so frightened. Could it be because she was captured? The girl stared at him without understanding. Speaking in the Balak tribe language, he tells her to go, which leaves her somewhat confused. So he tells her to flee. He learned the basics of their language from fighting against this tribe in his past life. The girl speaks a bunch of things, but he doesn't understand anything since he only knows the basics. Now leaving the room, she says some words and leaves. Vakir presumes she must be trying to thank him. After that, we finally find what we came for. He wanted Murcielago's corpse. Drawing his legendary weapon called Beelzebub, it's time for lunch, and today's dish is a big barbecue. <coughs> the next morning rumors began to spread about the nobles and members of state institutions who participated in the auction being taken to prison with severed body parts. That day the great demonic organization vanished from the city once and for all. All the VIPs who participated in that club had their identities exposed. As a result of the investigations, seven noble families whose relatives were indicted sent letters clamoring for justice to the consul. But Vakir's response was very harsh, as the penalty for illegal slave trafficking was death. He obtained the testimony of all the executed prisoners, and this will soon be taken to the imperial family. After that, the patriarchs of the seven families visited the consul and begged for mercy from the man who killed their relatives. But Vakir's response was quite simple. They would all have their territories confiscated within the Baskerville domain. All would be indicted for treason, and three of the families would be completely destroyed. To do all this it was necessary to hire more public officials in order to maintain order. This caused the unemployment rate in the city of Underdog to plummet, and thus Vakir to be treated better and better by the citizens. His relationship with his secretary Chihuahua also improved. The man says he's in debt to his boss now, since he saved him on circus night. During this time Vakir also trained his calligraphy, which impressed Chihuahua. The boy not only learned to write now but is already making new laws. If this prodigy continued working here, how far could the city of Underdorg evolve? Then night fell. The moonlight passed through the prison bars where we were now. It was possible to see that someone was handcuffed. Vakir was apologizing for not being able to come earlier, as he was busy working. This person was Cindy Wendyson Rose. Vakir says he has some questions to ask. The furious woman questions if he saved her just for this. Unconcerned, the boy says she had mentioned how Baron Gambino, even though just a depraved man, managed to accumulate influence and power quickly. He did some research and found out that the man was great at making money. If he had and used this talent for evil, he could have become a very renowned merchant or economist. So Vakir promises that if she answers his questions honestly, he'll let her out of here. However, if she doesn't answer, she'll regret it forever. Furious, she says that if she knows how to answer the questions, she'll answer all of them. Which makes Vakir say that's excellent. His first question is whether she thinks he's a fair man in the application of the laws, which makes her say he should better ask that to the lawman. But of course, if she doesn't answer truthfully, he won't keep his promise, so she says she thinks he's wrong. Vakir smirked maliciously at her response. Coming very close to her, he grabs the girl and asks why she thinks that. The boy had a bloodthirsty look in his eyes, of course. This scared the woman, but soon he let her go. Stepping back, he asks what he's doing wrong. He wants to hear it from her mouth. She says that he got those weak villains through fear and surprise and used that to create the image he has today. But in the long run, that will ruin his image. Furthermore, 
The patriarch won't be very happy to realize that the boy has more influence in the city than he himself does. Vakir asks what she advises to do. Wendy says he should return all authority to the Baskervilles. He should also give all credit for what happened here to the patriarch. So until he reaches the right age he should go to the Black Mountain Range or to the Empire Academy. He should be as discreet as possible and cultivate his strength in secret. Then when the time is right, he would give the Baskerville Patriarch what he deserves. At this moment a huge pressure took over the place. Vikir says that by the way she's talking, it's like she's sending a dog to bite its owner's neck. At this moment the pressure emanated by the boy was very suffocating. But still convinced of her thoughts, she says that this is the only way for him, a hunting dog, to vent his anger. Vikir watched closely, then gave a grand smile saying he liked what he heard. This caught the woman off guard. The boy says she knows how to give good advice and the ideas he himself had were very similar. So as promised, now she is free. Incredulous, she asks if she will really be released. He says he always keeps his promises. Leaving, she says she hopes the day never comes when he regrets the decision he made today. But she's soon interrupted by him asking if she knows the Mesmednero family. This was the eighth family that was destroyed here in Underdog. It was a family of merchants considered one of the richest. Of course, this family had a tragic end. It all happened when the youngest Mesmed Nero decided to demonstrate the fencing techniques he had learned to the people present at a birthday party. When the demonstration began, the Baskerville's envoys were surprised by the boy's talent. The fencing techniques the boy demonstrated were secret techniques shared only among the Baskervilles. News of a first-grade secret military technique had leaked out, and so the Baskerville family released their hunting dogs. That same day the entire Mesmed Nero family was extinguished. But the truth is that there were several people behind all that and these were the young demons from the other seven families. They stole the fencing book. The same book that contained the technique apprehended by young Mesmed Nero. The girl pretending to be clueless asks if this is the story of the eighth family and what it has to do with her. Vakir continues saying that there was a survivor of this family, and it was a one-year-old girl who was kidnapped by the seven nobles. Because the girl had an enviable appearance, she had to undergo all kinds of imaginable cruel tortures. Furious, Wendy says she won't hear about this anymore and starts to leave the room. However, Vikir says he hasn't finished telling the story yet. He tells that after a while a new vice consul arrived in the city and he gathered all the criminals and punished them without hesitation. By coincidence of fate they were the same seven idiots who screwed the Mesmed Nero family. This new vice consul tortured the seven idiots as much as he could and as they died slowly, they began to spit out all the sins they had committed. It. it was then that this vice consul heard one of them say, I'm sorry for committing the mortal crime. Furious and crying, she asks if he thinks she will believe that story. But he says she is the survivor of the Mesmed Nero and knows her past. So the girl asks how she can trust him? How can she believe that he really captured and tortured everyone making them apologize? Grabbing a torch to light the way, Vakir says she'll believe after seeing with her own eyes. The girl couldn't believe what she was seeing. The bodies of all the men were still there. On the ground, it was written repeatedly that they were wrong and didn't want to die. Seeing this, the girl cried even more, and obviously couldn't hold what was in her stomach. Vakir approaching says that even though these guys paid for their crimes, the revenge of the Mesmed Nero family isn't over yet. Cindy Wendy and Mesmed Nero must channel all her hatred towards the Baskerville family. She deserves this revenge. Confused, she says he's also a Baskerville and asks why he's helping? The boy just says that's a very stupid question. Wendy couldn't understand what he meant by that, but says she'll repay that debt in the future. She promises that no matter what he does in life, she will ensure he never runs out of money. Vikir is very happy with such words and says he'll remember that. The next morning, it was possible to hear someone approaching the door. This was Chihuahua saying that the vice consul is a sleeper because the sun has already risen. But when he went to look, the bed was completely covered in ketchup and there were several bodies all over the place. Vikir woke up normally saying good morning to the secretary. He even jokes that he doesn't remember very well what happened and thinks he killed them while he was sleeping. What kind of childhood did you have at home? A very violent one. The problem is that recently he's been going through some very dangerous situations. He took two poison arrows, drank four also poison drinks. They tried to melt him with acid, shooting, fire, cart trampling. The situation is really complicated. Should I be worried Chihuahua? I think you'll be fine. At the last illegal auction he managed to get rank A high vitality skill of the Inferno Buffalo. This ability, along with the fact that he entered the Styx River, meant that not even last night's assassins could kill him. Was the shirt washed in the Styx River too? What do you mean by that? Still, 
This situation is very annoying and he intends to find and kill whoever is behind it. Some time later a carriage arrived. In it there was a Baskerville banner. Someone from his house had come to see him. But when this person started to get out of the carriage, Chihuahua panicked. Quickly he saluted. The one who came to see Vakir was the butler of his family. As they exchanged greetings, Chihuahua couldn't stop being impressed. This man was the current head of the Barrymore family that has served as butlers for the Baskervilles for four generations. He was impressed that he could see his idol like this in person. The Kier asked why the butler had come here. This was because the patriarch recognized the boy's achievements and asked to take him back immediately. Upset, the Kier thinks Hugo must have been happy about this. So now we're directly in Hugo's office. He was looking at how the favorite person among the citizens of the city of Underdog now was the Kier. He also managed titles like the most trustworthy person among the merchants, the most loved person among the farmers, the most beloved person by the children, the person with the most support from the scholars, and also the person the assassins most want to kill. Hugo says that with this they managed to erase that image that the Baskervilles can be intelligent, but they're not so good with swords. Then he says that his son did a great job. Vakir thanks the patriarch, but found it strange to see happiness on his face. It was then that the patriarch said that just as there are punishments he must also give rewards. So he asks what the boy thinks of entering the academy this year. This caught Fakir off guard since that was the reward he wanted. That's the place where all the elites gather, the best academy in the kingdom called Colosseum. As it's attended by most of the children of nobles and aristocrats, the academy has strong internal security and operates as a boarding school. In short, this will give him enough time to get stronger away from Hugo. The patriarch says he would like to send a few more people there, but has no one in mind besides Vakir. So he asks if the boy has anyone in mind he'd like to take along. Vakir says that of all his siblings, the ones he's closest to are the triplets. Of course, the intention is to use them as punching bags. However, Hugo said he can't allow the three to go together and even questions if the boy still remembers the plan he made when he was only eight years old. This was the plan to leave the mine under the care of the morgues, to get rid of the barbarian clan. Hugo, completely happy, says that plan worked. At first, the morgue suggested they launch a joint attack but obviously keeping it discreet. In short, Hugo asks if he's not wanting to stop by that place and see with his own eyes if his plan is being followed to the letter. The boy just says he'll do as the patriarch orders. Now we were leaving through the gates of the city of Underdog. Chihuahua was bidding farewell with sadness in his eyes. He wished us a good trip and said he would take care of things while the vice consul was away. Finally, the time came for us to leave this city. Now on the way to the new destination, Vakir orders them to appear. Instantly, several knights fell from the sky. The boy apologized for keeping them waiting. He did so because he didn't want to have a chaotic start. Staffordshire Baskerville says it's no problem, and they will accompany him to the morgue's fortress. On the way, Vakir asks about his uncle Boston Terrier, and he's told that the man was very excited to bring him to the Pitbull Knights after what happened at the slave auction. So we finally arrived at the morgue's territory. There were several farmers working in the fields. Of course Vakir already knew that this wasn't just an inspection mission but also to subjugate the barbarians. From the information we have, the Mords clan summoned two delegates, 30 members of the clan itself, and 100 wizards from outside the clan. While on the Baskerville side they sent only Vakir, a delegate, and a few dozen common soldiers. It seems their intention is to gather more information about the barbarian clan. At this moment it was possible to see the Mords fortress. There were several stakes with skulls hanging on it. This was the work of a wizard, probably the the morgues are trying to send a message to the barbarians. Seeing this reminds Vikir of Kamu and noticing that she's much stronger now. Suddenly it was possible to see three silhouettes on top of the wall. These people told them to stop and asked who they were. They were saying that no one could enter here without their permission. Of course, Vikir knows these three very well. They are the three morgues flowers. The triplets called High Sis, Middle Sis, and Low Sis. Is this author playing some kind of prank with these names? Vikir just says they are the envoys of the Baskerville clan and have come for a territorial inspection to assist with the mission, so he orders them to open the gates. The girl says it won't work since they have to report to the territory supervisor and asks them to wait here. Maybe tomorrow the permission will be ready. This leads the boy to ask why they're trying to prevent the territory master from entering here. Drawing from the situation, the girl asks if he's going to use the territory owner card, even saying that they have a tenant protection law made by his own family. Vakir starting to get furious says he has already amended that law and now the owner can kick out the tenants whenever he wants. So this is the last time he'll speak. He orders them to open the gates immediately. Just with that, the girls panicked, but one of them got furious. She said she heard 
understood that an idiot had been appointed to command the city of Underdog. Then casting a spell against Fakir, she says she won't let them walk all over them. The water spell hit very close to the boy. The girl didn't seem intimidated and was shouting that they wouldn't enter the morgue's territory, even questioning if the Baskerville genius was confident enough to try to show them. The one in charge of the knights was already drawing his sword when some men back there started insulting the triplets on the wall. The Kier noticed that these voices were familiar. The twins felt super offended saying they would put them in their place. The three then took the lead saying they wouldn't take back their words. They were the Baskerville triplets. I'm feeling embarrassed for the battle that is about to come. Triplets against triplets? Vakir himself felt disdain seeing this situation. Suddenly one of them turns saying he wants to repay for the recommendation Vakir made to the patriarch for them to enter the academy. Vakir knows that these triplets would become legitimate killing machines in the future and that they were great at following orders. So obviously he stirs the pot even more since he intends to tame them to use them in the future. The three were shouting saying they were the best but the boys were just showing them the middle finger saying they were just jerks. This made the girls furious, so they used the three elements they possessed together to amplify their magic tens of times. That's why they were known as the three flowers of the morgues in their past lives. One of the triplets says they shouldn't be afraid of just some twigs, and he immediately used the first Baskerville style, which impressed the leader of the knights. But soon he was caught off guard, and pushed back by one of the twigs. The girls were mocking saying they would never be touched by mere swordsmen. This fueled their anger even more. The commander of the the knight says this will be fun, as they will see firsthand the outcome of the ancient debate about which is better between swords and magic. It will be fun to see the talent and potential of the young ones who will be the leaders of the sword and magic clan in the future. Vakir says if that's the case he's also a promise of the clan, but the delegate says he's on a much higher level and shouldn't be compared. The boy, realizing this was a waste of time, says he'll have to move forward as he has much to discuss. Fakir just wanted everyone to die already. When suddenly someone appears on the scene, conjuring fire magic in her hands she asks what's happening in her area. One of the triplets was almost reaching one of the mages, when suddenly he saw a flash coming towards him. It was a massive fire magic. The explosion had a huge proportion. Fakir was glad to see this explosion since he really wanted them to die. But soon he got frustrated because everyone was alive and only scorched. On the side of the triplets it was the same. You must already know who arrived at this place. Bakir was surprised to see her so early. Who was on the wall now? was Kamu Morg, the girl he met when he was 8 years old. She was saying she couldn't forgive troublemakers who entered her territory. The girls calling Kamu by her first name say it was they who started it. This makes her furious, and she asks when did she let them call her by name like that. She even said that if they don't want to stay hanging there they should be careful with their words. At that moment she glanced to the side and was impressed with what she saw. Who was in front of her was Vakir Van Baskerville. Her behavior changed immediately and she already said that it's been more than seven years since they last saw each other. Vakir says it has been a long time indeed. In his mind he thinks she's starting to have a woman's body and even her breasts are growing. Is this the appearance of the woman who they say has conquered all all the men of high society, Camille Moore, back then all men chased after her, and she was involved in all sorts of scandals. But why hasn't he heard any of these rumors in this life yet? Of course, that doesn't matter much to him. So he just asked to open the gates since the triplets didn't want to cooperate. This leaves Cammy furious, saying that after all this time, is that all he has to say? The boy just asks if he should say something else, which makes her even more angry. The chief of the knights thinks that after the confrontation of the triplets there would now be the confrontation of two great stars from each family. Then pointing to Vakir she says his score is zero, whining. She asks how he dares to behave like this in front of his future wife. He deserves a zero score out of a total of 100. Everyone was left puzzled. Vakir almost had a heart attack. Future wife? Some time later, in the fields, Kami was walking with Vakir and saying that the Baskervilles don't seem to know much about the barbarians. But the boy says that, in fact, it's not like that. As they've been facing them for much longer, he's sure they know more than the morgues about it. Which makes the girl ask then why they sent only the worst here. Vakir says that the decision to come here to the mountains had already been discussed with the morgues before. So why is she asking this? Changing the subject, Camus says she'll give him 8 points for knowing so much about the barbarians, and now he has 8 out of 100 points. This makes him ask why he got so few points since his answer was perfect. She says she hates smart men. Men should have more idiotic tastes. After that, she gives him six points for riding a horse, questioning why his horse is taller than hers, saying maybe that's because he's shorter. She also gives him four points for fashion, 
claiming his clothes are dull, and for not answering her questions, he gets one point in the etiquette category. Vakir is about to punch her in the face that she'll need about five points to close the hole. Suddenly blushing, she says that in the face category he deserves 99 points, saying he's grown quite a bit, but deducting one point because he can't control his expressions. He just tells her to stop with these useless scores, which makes her ask why he thinks it's useless. Her husband has to follow very strict standards. This makes him ask why he would be her future husband. Again getting furious, she says because he passed her uncle's test. She's probably referring to what happened more than 7 years ago. Talking about this makes her furious since thanks to her uncle her marriage was promised for the future and not at that present moment. Suddenly Vakir tells her to forget what happened that day. They must pretend that nothing ever happened. This makes her blush. Then she throws a piece of clothing in his face so hard that it left a mark on his face, saying she'll never forget something that happened between them. The boy even asks what was that she threw at him. When suddenly he remembers what it is, it's the jacket he lent her that day. The girl says it's nothing valuable. Yet Vakir, on the other hand, wonders if she's returning it without even washing it. Getting back to what matters, she says the barbarians are invading the mines and stealing their slaves, besides destroying their crops. This gigantic wall was built by earth and iron mages about a month ago. They did in just a month the work that hundreds of people together would take more than a year to do. But on that wall, there were marks left by Balak's arrows. It seems that their arrows are so strong that they can pierce even walls two to three meters thick, and they have hit and killed several soldiers during the night shift without even noticing. His own uncle was severely injured by an arrow that pierced his magical shield. Besides, we already have a report from Hugo himself saying he got a nose wound from one of these barbarians. Vakir says there must be great talents even among the barbarians and asks if she knows anything. Camu says there seemed to be a very strong woman, but they were not easy to identify due to all the paint they apply on their faces. Suddenly someone comes running calling for the vice captain. It seems the search party captured a live barbarian scout. So at that moment, we went to the morgue's tent. There was a man with paint all over his body tied up looking at them. This was one of the Rococo clan witches who hasn't given any information so far. Not even mind control magic is working on him due to some powerful witchcraft. Kamya asks if the man remembers when they invaded the morgue's fortress and took some of their men. She said among these people there was a little girl named Rose, who was her distant cousin. The man smiles and says a few words in the barbarian's language, which makes the other prisoners laugh. Kamya says they need a translator and asks where the deserter barbarians are, but her vassal says they were all killed or captured when they were attacked. At this point, Vikir says he knows how to speak a little of the Rococo language. The surprised girl asks if there's anything he can't do, and asks him to inquire about her cousin who is a red-haired, 12-year-old girl with red eyes and white skin who was kidnapped in the last attack. So Vikir does, as ordered. The man starts <laughs> laughing mockingly until he utters a few words with a malicious look on his face. Vikir closes his eyes in discontent with what he heard, and just tells Kamya that the girl is dead. This leaves the woman completely furious. Then, saying that the other representatives are busy, this trial will be conducted by herself, Vice Captain Camu Moore, and her verdict for today is the immediate execution of the prisoner. A stake impaled the man, while he said words in his tribe's native language, she told him to speak as much as he wanted, because when this war ended, their language could only be heard in hell. The other prisoners panic seeing this situation, but Camu just says they should leave the room. Bakir just watched the situation, but when he left the place, the girl was crying outside. He thinks that even though she is strong, she's still 15 years old, and tries to comfort the girl. The deceased girl was very sweet and kind-hearted, which didn't fit with the morgues. Bakir tries to console her again by saying she must have at least rested in peace. But Kamya asks if he thinks she's an idiot? She may not speak the language, but she can hear. So she asks if what she heard was really right. What that man said before he died was that he did those inappropriate things with the girl. This makes Kamya cry even more. She held back as much as she could, then finally fell into despair. She keeps apologizing for not being able to protect the girl. Vakir thought of calming her down, but soon gave up. I don't know if he didn't know what to do or if he preferred not to get involved. Some time later, Kamu was saying they should get revenge on them as soon as possible. Vakir extends his hand and says she's right. The girl blushed at this, when she was about to take his hand. A bell started ringing loudly, 
This is a sign of a barbarian attack. It seems their revenge came sooner than she imagined. On the hill a little distant from the castle, it was possible to see the paw of a wolf. There was a barbarian riding it with her bow and arrows loaded. She aimed precisely. Then she shot with all her strength towards two guards on top of the wall. When they noticed they were in the sights of the Balak, it was already too late. The arrow pulverized everything in its path. After that, the person who shot the arrow gave some orders in their native language, thus starting the attack against the Mord clan. Quickly they captured several people. They were running with wolves at full speed. The Kier was thinking if he arrived too quickly by coming alone, suddenly some sort of lasso was coming his way. He had just been captured by the Balak tribe yet the boy didn't seem to care. The women were happy, saying they finally found a man and this time he must be a good husband. With that, Vikir deduces that the barbarians hunt for husbands and wives to have superior lineage. So, with just a wave of his hand, he throws the women flying, saying unfortunately he cannot be their husband since he was promised to someone else. The men of the tribe point their bows at Vakir, who at this moment was going towards them, thinking that Hugo asked him to promise not to engage in combat until he joined the main forces. But can he wait for them? Vakir was defending himself from all the arrows sent, which left all the Balak tribe impressed. Camu arrived conjuring a fireball, blowing everything up and asking why they haven't killed them yet and are just standing there. The Balak warriors screamed screamed in pain. Camu would have no mercy with her enemies. She wanted to wipe out their entire clan. Suddenly, she looked at the boy asking if he was using a liquid aura. She thought he was a graduate, and therefore the only man who would have her recognition. But in his defense, he says the patriarch ordered him to only fight in the presence of the main forces. Of course, this order does not apply to her. So, unleashing a sea of flames, she says she will take care of everything alone. Bakir noticed her power had really grown stronger since she's using a quadruple channeling. Kami was furious saying she would avenge her little sister. But suddenly one of the warriors blew a dart towards her, hitting her neck perfectly. The man was mounted on a white wolf. Quickly she fell to the ground unable to move, and this was probably due to paralysis poison. <laughs> Got <he. laughs> Got <he. laughs> the warrior immediately threw the rope to catch her, but Vakir stepped in front to defend. His idea was to leave while hers was to save the land and the prisoners. She was also obsessed with avenging her sister. Vakir was giving her another lecture when suddenly, he noticed an arrow coming from behind his head. He dodged at the last second, escaping the fierce attack. The woman who shot that arrow was standing on top of a tent, probably the woman Camu mentioned earlier. Suddenly, Camu was caught. She started screaming for Vakir. He remembered that in his previous life she was also kidnapped by the barbarians when she was still young, and it didn't take long for her to annihilate the entire tribe and return home, becoming known as the Crimson Black Queen. He thought of doing something when that woman was already by his side ready to hit him. Again he dodged the blow, and noticed it was an attempt to strike with a bow. The next moment, he took a kick to the stomach that threw him away. To sum up, he will have to take this fight seriously. But soon he was surprised. The girl was saying she had already said they would meet again. She was giving a wicked smile. Vakir finally noticed who this girl was. She was the same one he saved at the slave auction. This already made him say she is repaying good with evil. But she just says this is revenge and she doesn't care about him. Then, mounting her wolf, she says if he really wants his girl back, he must follow them. Vakir was thinking if he should reveal his power when someone started shouting for Camu. This was Adolf Morg who came running after hearing about the ambush. Quickly he conjured an earth spell ordering them to release his niece. But the wolves were running and dodging the magic very very easily. They quickly took distance from the area. This left the man even more furious. At this moment, one of the vassals reported they fled to the unexplored area of Mount Rouge. Adolf knows very well that this unexplored area is a dangerous place they still don't fully know, and it will be impossible to follow them at night. But someone behind them says they can still follow them. This was Vakir saying he already entered the unexplored area when he was young. But of course, this was related to his past life. Astonished, Adolf asks if what he's saying is true. One of the vassals says it's suicide to go to Mount Rouge at night, which makes Adolf say whoever wants to give up can do so. He doesn't intend to make it a problem for everyone. In his mind, he thought he knew this child was different, and that now he could only trust his words. So he pleads to please save his niece. When night fell, we were in Baskerville territory, in the dense forest of Mount La Rouge et Lenoir. In this place there are mosquitoes that suck bones, thorny vines that contain deadly poison, spiders that move silently, and other dangerous things. A normal person wouldn't last an hour in this place, and that's why it was called the soul-devouring forest. But of course, 
This does not apply to a certain someone. Adolf was asking the leader of the knights if all the young people of the Baskerville clan are like this boy. But the leader says absolutely not. The young master is special even among the special people of the clan. He walked through the insects as if they were nothing. Everyone thought his fencing skills were amazing, in addition to his stealthy movement and perfect sense of direction. Suddenly he stops and asks everyone to wait. It seems the Balak tribe didn't go very far. He explains that hunters spread dry leaves to hear their enemies approach approaching, and they must be careful from here. So Adolf cast a silent spell on Vakir, saying this spell will prevent him from making noise while walking. He also warns that from now on he will be alone, and that he will never forget this favor his nephew is doing him. He's already considering the boy his nephew. <laughs> boy. Everyone was around a campfire talking. Cammy was shouting that she would burn them all when she got out of there. But people didn't seem to care and were talking about liking that boy they almost caught before. Cammy gave up shouting after realizing people were just talking about getting husbands and hunting wives. She was pensive when someone approached her. The man was saying that since he got a good female, all the men in the tribe would be jealous. The warrior didn't understand what she was saying, but it was obvious she was rebellious. So he began to say that he would have to educate this arrogant slave. Suddenly the other warrior appears telling him to release his slave. The man in his defense says he was the one who got her, but the girl tells him not to talk nonsense. If she hadn't stopped that sword boy, the warrior would be dead now. To sum up, she's claiming that this girl is now her property. The man even tries to say that she's a woman and shouldn't be with a slave, but she does doesn't care about that. The warrior already points his finger saying she's stubborn and won't let this happen just because she's the captain. So furious, she says she can challenge her whenever she doesn't like it, but that in this way, she will crush him. The man trembled all over. Then he says he prefers not to challenge her and she can do whatever she wants. To sum up, the woman won this argument. She starts by saying the girl has a good appearance as well as a good body. She must have an excellent lineage and is probably the next morgue leader. But steps on her shoulder saying that she was also captured and sold as a slave by the morgues before. She says that at least she received kindness and managed to escape her fate as a slave. However, such kindness will not be repaid to her. From now on, she will spend time slowly engraving this into her bones and tame even the girl's soul, until her life is only about licking her fingers with her tongue. But at this moment an explosion occurs behind the girl. She turns around worried and without understanding. Soon the guards say they are under attack. There was a mage setting fire to the entire place. Camius recognized whose voice it was. This was her uncle calling for his niece thirsty for revenge. At this moment the battle had already begun, but there was something very strange that Vakir noticed. The Balak hunters who usually had well-coordinated attacks, now were all confused and directionless. Some were even calling the morgues crazy, saying they were causing chaos in the middle of the night. Adolf, realizing they were fleeing, sent soldiers after them. Camille was happy with the outcome of the story, when suddenly she heard someone behind her, turning to look. It was Vakir telling her to be quiet. He quickly cut the ropes. The girl asked if he came to save her, but he just asked if she didn't understand the gesture to stay quiet. Suddenly someone appears saying they knew the sword boy would come. The boy owner of a strong body capable of crossing great distances in a short time, and of a mental strength capable of breaking the darkness. A virgin who would risk everything to save his woman. Laughing, she says he doesn't need to ask about the past, and that he can pass. Vikir is a little confused by such words, while Kami begins to engage in a mental battle against the girl. But it doesn't make sense that he has no memory of this girl in his past life. Is she the archer who hurt Hugo's nose, known as the Night Fox? While he pondered this, Someone aimed a dart at them. Using Belzebu, he immediately defended Camu from this attack. The warrior is incredulous, wondering how he knew. So, picking up the girl, he says he'll take her to his uncle. She agrees with that. They both flee as fast as they can from the scene. The girl somewhat understands the situation. But it's not as if she could let the future leader of the Morgue clan escape like this. Again she pulls her bow with all her strength and makes a gigantic shot towards them. The arrow was heading towards Camu, but at the same moment the entire forest froze. The arrow was stopped at the last moment. This was Adolf Morg's power. The old man arrived at the last moment to save his niece. He immediately started casting a poison and healing spell, saying he would take her to the sacred family when they returned. But the girl interrupts the process, running into Vakir's arms saying he saved her again.
The old man stands there saying he worked hard too, but the girl reprimands him saying she'll tell everything to her mother. At this moment a rope was passing over Vakir's head. That archer was trying to catch him saying they don't have any more time and they must go now. But she realized the boy wasn't being pulled and even asked what kind of monstrous force he has. Vakir easily frees himself from the ropes and asks why they're so impatient. When suddenly we're shown an abyssal form. A monstrous sound came from the depths of the forest. The archer in panic says she finally awakened. Even Belzebu started sending warning signals, saying they should flee that something was coming here. The archer also says out loud that she was coming. Madame Eight Legs was coming their way. Suddenly something gigantic emerged from the ground towards the sky with a devastating aura. All the Balak warriors were amazed saying the Madame finally appeared. At first, they didn't quite understand what it was. But soon that thing turned into several things and shot off in all directions. Adolf Morg says this can't be true. How could a monster like that be hidden here? Vakir was also terrified, saying if his memories are correct. That thing that appeared in front of them now was an S-rank calamity. The eight-legged madam, a devastating monster capable of exterminating an entire continent. Kami was about to scream when Vakir interrupted her, saying that thing there, even if it doesn't see, has very sensitive hearing and skin. Vakir says there were many incidents on Mount Rouge at that time and a local resident told him that there was a creature that was a kind of legend in the region, and they named her Madame Eight Legs. After many revisions, the Empire's monster catalog began to include this eight-legged madam. She had an S-level danger, she was an extinction-level monster, a monster capable of destroying an entire country alone. At this moment she was throwing acid at them. The Balak warrior was screaming because some poison had fallen on his hair. Soon his hair was cut. The archer was furious saying he was making too much noise in front of the madam. Because of this noise, the monster was looking at them at that moment. She quickly orders everyone to retreat. On the morgue side it is also ordered to retreat. The Balak fled, spreading like wildfire, while the morgues and the Baskervilles fled all together in a large group. That small difference in how they were fleeing gave the madam the priority to choose who she wanted to pursue. It was certainly the group with the largest number of people together. One of the mages says that insects are weak against fire and asks to leave it to him. The guy really casts a spell towards the spider, which hit her precisely. The boy was saying it worked, when in the blink of an eye, the guy who was beside him disappeared. That's because he had been pierced by one of the madam's legs. He barely barely noticed when it happened, so he finally understood that now it was too late. He would be the next snack for the madam. Desperate, Adolf begins to ask what kind of monstrosity this is. Vakir was pensive on the way. Then he stopped and said he would stay behind. The leader of the knights asks what he's doing. The boy says if they continue like this, everyone will be killed, so someone needs to stay to stop the monster's legs. The man was about to say he would stay in the boy's place, but Vakir asks if the leader of the guard thinks he can stop the monster with the skills he has. He also states that they cannot take this calamity to their territory and at the moment the best chance to tie her legs is himself. Then he tells Adolf that they don't have any more time and asks please for him to make a choice. Kami couldn't do anything and just watch the situation. The man was hesitating when Vakir shouted for him to make the decision quick then the old man ran out saying he wouldn't let the boy's sacrifice be in vain. Meanwhile Camu was shouting for him not to stay behind. He was about to draw his sword, but quickly changed his mind as that would be just a facade, and this weapon would have no effect against it. In short, Vakir thinks this is a perfect opportunity for him. If he can fake his death and escape Hugo's gaze, he can gain time and learn the ten techniques. So when he has skills enough to not be pressured by the patriarch, or at least to be able to completely hide his abilities, he will return to the family. Drawing Belzebu in its full form out, he understands that if he doesn't give his all, he will be killed today by the S-rank calamity in front of him. He has crossed the river Styx and also possesses the advanced fencing of the Baskervilles, in addition to wielding the demonic sword Belzebu. He intends to attack with everything he has, so he dashed at full speed towards the monster, jumping as high as he could. We were higher than Madame herself at this moment she noticed a possible threat in front of her. Vakir loaded his strike, putting all his aura into it, to the point of breaking the air around him. He then unleashed the fifth Baskerville Fong against the monster. The blow was so immense and catastrophic that a light emerged in the middle of the forest. It shone brightly and then exploded. It was possible to hear it for miles around. Camu couldn't believe what she was seeing. The girl was crying for her beloved. This was the day that would be remembered in history. The day a boy who hadn't even become an adult yet became a hero. This story is sensational. I can't wait to do the next part. Thank you for watching. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and share with your friends. See you in the next video. Bye for now.